coming down, I want to call to order the Metropolitan Planning Commission meeting of December 12th. Thank you everyone for coming down and being patient with us for starting. And uh, for everybody that's standing up, we we really need, um, per our fire marshal, there's more seats in the audience. If you guys could, could come up, sit down. I appreciate it. We really do appreciate that. Thank you very much. So we are on to the adoption of the agenda, commissioners. Uh, these have been provided to you prior to the meeting. Is there a motion to approve? There's been a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Opposed no, ayes have it. And the agenda is adopted. We are on to item C, which is the approval of the no November 14th, 2019 minutes. Uh, and those were sent to you prior as well. And are there any questions, additions, edits? Motion to approve and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And the minutes are adopted for November 14th. Now we're on to the recognition of the council members, which we, which we do just by uh, it's first come, first serve. So whoever we see first come in and we saw... Uh, Councilman Syracuse, you want to go now or later on your item? Okay, perfect. <laughs> Council Lady Van Reese, you want to go now? Come on up. Welcome. Appreciate you coming down. Let's see if the microphone is off, Council Lady. Yep, it's Testing on. Testing one, two, three. You got to talk um, into it, I think. WMOT, yeah. Roots Radio, testing one, there two, three. There we go. Um, I, uh, happy holidays, everybody. It's good to see everybody here, and I'm happy to see uh, former council member Amina Johnson here on behalf of the mayor's office. I'm so glad that you're part of the process along with uh, your colleague, Ms. Murphy. Um, I have a, a couple of things that have been uh, postponed until January, and we'll talk about that, but there's one thing that has been reapplied onto consent, the Corsi Farms project, and I wanted just to speak uh, to that because uh, it is uh, not going directly to council, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, every once in a while, a piece of private land has a very public emotional connection. The Corsi Farm on East Campbell in Madison is one of these places. I remember when Joan and I moved to the neighborhood in 1990, it was one of the reasons I liked living there. The wide open space and the horses and the donkeys reminded me of my Oklahoma heritage. I learned later that there had been at least two generations of families that have felt that in this place uh, and it was as important to them as it was to me. When the Corsi family came to us nearly two years ago with a proposal from a Hendersonville real estate agent, we showed up. We made sure the family knew that we wanted Mr. Corsi to have some peace of mind at the end of his journey. Mr. Corsi has since passed. We all agreed as a community that we wanted development to happen not just for us, uh, but for his family, and yet not to us. At that time, we rejected a multifamily project of 120 townhomes. We got it down to about 80, but it still didn't feel right. We waited. We waited. The family was as committed to the community and to that vision as I was, so we waited. Because this will not go to Metro Council public hearing, it's essential that the new owners and I and the neighborhood and the community at, at large that loves the property know and understand what is happening. So I wrote these words and additional long email uh, that has received uh, over 2,000 views on my email newsletter and in social media to make sure people knew what was going on. Um, we have uh, an opportunity now uh, to have some grand homes on this property. Uh, they're proposing three, four, and even five bedroom homes ranging from 1,900 to 2,800 square feet with brick and stone and hardy wood. Now, 
this isn't an SP, so you never know what people are going to do, right? They say that. But how do you know? Um, the family and the developers have agreed to that as part of getting this property, so we know. The market values of these homes are going to range anywhere from three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars in the area there on East Campbell. The planning department and the planning staff was diligent in making sure that the community plans were adhered to, that the setbacks were accurate, and that connectivity was in place. This is an approval for 44 new lots at 500 and 510 East Campbell at the northwest corner of Highland Circle and East Campbell Road. It's about uh, 23 and a half acres of land. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this in a public setting since it's going to be decided here today, but I wanted to make sure that you knew since this was such an important place in Madison that it has been discussed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Aid, and that's item 21 for everyone. Uh, next, uh, Councilman Glover. Where's Councilman Glover? There he is. I was looking over here. <laughs> Welcome, Councilman. Chairman, how are you, sir? Wonderful, thank you. Good. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you and to all of y'all. Uh, as we say down in Alabama, all of y'all. Uh, so normally I would never come in and speak about an issue because frankly, my commitment to every district council member is if they're committed to an idea, they think it's the right thing for their district, I believe that it's my job to uh, help them try and pass it if it is a good idea. If not, I want to listen and, and, and do the same thing you guys do, all right? So I'm not here to talk to you about a council district issue. I'd like to talk to you, please, if I may, about 2019, I think this is uh, item number six, Chair, 2019Z-020TX-001. Uh, and this is a request, if I, if I may, uh, Chair, I'll read it. A, a request for an ordinance amending section 17.16.250 of Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws relative to home occupation. This is something that's not brand new. This commission, this council, uh, we, we've dealt with this multiple times. And candidly, uh, it, it's a slippery slope. When we open up these doors, it creates havoc that we can't always imagine. Uh, I'm, and I'll go ahead and tell you, the STRPs, we have, with that passed when? Gosh, six, seven years ago, and we're still dealing with it because we haven't been able to deal with it. You know, here's the one thing that I know and here's the one thing that I respect. The people in the neighborhoods, they want it to be a neighborhood. We can disagree on what type of home might be built, what kind of siding, what kind of this or what kind of that might be there, but they want it to be their home. And I think we have to respect that. The one thing that always bothered me is the council had never allowed businesses to open inside of a neighborhood. Um, in fact, uh, I think, I'm, I'm trying to remember, uh, Chairman, I think you and at the time, then Councilman uh, Jamison were on the council together. Am I, am I remembering that correctly or incorrectly? That was a long time ago. It was a long time ago, but I'm old. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. I believe okay. that's right. And, and so Councilman Jamison at the time introduced a bill very similar to this. And it didn't, it didn't pass. And then it's been tried again and tried again and tried again. And then, then we let the STRPs come in. And, well, BZA, I mean, we can all talk about that. Again, I'm not going to come in here and speak on behalf uh, for or against an issue in a, in a council member's district. That's not my place. But this is a citywide issue. And so I would ask respect, respectfully, please, Chair, Director, and the members of this commission, uh, 
if nothing else, defer it. Let's keep talking about it and look at the unintended consequences, which I think there are multiple uh, amounts there. So I think I, think I had, uh, you brought up a good point. I had a, a lady, a constituent in my neighborhood that wanted to sell vegetables out of her house. And so that's back then, that was what she was doing. But anyway, it's been going on a long time. And we had a, I remember we had a very uh, robust debate about this particular and issue. And you did. I happened to be there at, yeah. and, and paying attention at that time. And, and so being old has its advantages on occasion. Uh, so I, w I would simply ask you, I'm not going to tell you how to vote. I'm simply going to ask you to think through the consequences and look at where we are now on STRPs and then determine, do we really want to open up another can of worms? And I'll close with that. I hope everyone has a very Merry Christmas. May God bless you and thank you very much. Chair, Director, thank you guys. Thank you for the work you do and for the time you give us. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next, we, I saw Councilman Parker. Come on up. Welcome. I believe this is your first time in front of the commission. Welcome. As Maybe. a council member, it is. Yes, thank you. Well, and uh, thank you all for being here this evening. Um, I am here um, for item 25 on the agenda. This is a request to rezone from CL to MULA on Dickerson Pike. Um, I asked the applicant to come to a neighborhood meeting on this one. Um, and I would say that most people are pretty comfortable with the uh, density and bulk associated with MULA. Um, there are some particular land uses that um, I think are probably going to address at the council level, um, specifically STRPs. Um, and there's also some concern around parking, although I'm not sure that we're going to do anything about that at the council level. Um, I'm happy to work with the applicant and with the community um, to see if maybe we do need to do something there or if um, we, can, we can work something else out. But I do support staff's recommendation on item 25 and um, we will address some of the community concerns at the council level. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate you coming down. Absolutely. Very much. Councilman Rosenberg, you wanna go now or during the item? Thank you, sir. And I didn't see any other council members. I wanna make sure though. Help me, because there are several new ones, so I wanna, don't want to miss anyone. Okay, making sure. All right, seeing no other council members, we are now on to item E, which is items for deferral withdrawal. Lisa? The following items are for deferral or withdrawal. Item number one, 2019 CP 005002 on page five of your agenda, the East Nashville Community Plan Amendment, Dickerson South Corridor Study. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 27th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. Item number 2A, 2019 CP 014001, Donaldson Hermitage Old Hickory Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 16th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. Item number 2B, the associated case, 2019Z158PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 16th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 3, 2014SP082002, the Wedgwood Lofts SP periodic review. Staff recommendation is to withdraw. Item number four, 2019 SP 047001, the Nipfer Corner SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 16th Planning Commission meeting. Item number eight, 2018 SP 085001 on page six of your agenda. The 1313 53rd Avenue North SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 16th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 10, 2019 SP 055001 on page seven of your agenda. 2018 Maplewood Trace. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 16th Planning Commission meeting. 
Item number 14, 2019 SP 071001 on page eight of your agenda, the Finery North SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 16th meeting. Item number 15, 2019 SP 072001, the 20, Trinity 24 SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 16th meeting. Item number 16, 2019 SP 073001, 429 Houston Street. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 16th Planning Commission meeting. And item number 17, 2019 S080001, the resub of the Maxim Holdings LLC property. Staff recommendation is to defer to the January 16th meeting. Thank you, Lisa. And so, commissioners, make sure I get these right and that we're all on the same page. So, the items for deferral withdrawal are items one, 2A, 2B, 3, 4, 8, 10, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Is that correct, Lisa? That's correct. All right, commissioners, you've heard those items. Is there a motion to defer? There's a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those items are deferred. We are on to item F, the consent agenda. Lisa. I did want to first also mention that the January 16th, February 13th, and February 27th meetings are at an alternate location. They will not be held in this room. They will be held at 4 p.m. at 2601 Bransford Avenue, which is the Metro Board of Education Administration Building. And so that's the January 16th meeting and both meetings in February. Those are due to elections. Thank you, and we always notice that on uh, social media and, and the internet. Okay, perfect. Lisa, you are on consent agenda. Yes. As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. As notice to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. The following items are on the consent agenda. Item 5A, 2019 SP 068001 on page six of your agenda. Stewart's Ferry Pike Multifamily. It's a request to rezone from CL to SP for property located on Stewart's Ferry Pike to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The associated case item 5B, 15574P009. The Larchwood PUD cancellation. It's a request to cancel a portion of a planned unit development located on Stewart's Ferry Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number seven, 2017 SP 048005, the Somerset SP amendment. It's a request to amend a specific plan for properties located on Lebanon Pike to permit 79 multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 11, 2019 SP 063001 on page seven of your agenda, 1711 Fifth Avenue. It's a request to rezone from R6A to SP for properties located on Fifth Avenue North to permit seven multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 12, 2019 SP 065001 on page seven, 1400 Arthur SP. It's a request to rezone from R6A to SP for properties located on Arthur Avenue Staff uh, to permit six multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 13, 2019 SP 069001 on page seven, 1228 Fourth Avenue North SP. It's a request to rezone from IR to SP for property located on Fourth Avenue North to permit six multifamily residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. And I will note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number 18, 2019 S217001 on page eight of your agenda. 
McClendon's subdivision. It's a request for final plat approval to create three lots on property located on Tusculum, Lo Tusculum Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 19, 2019-S-219-001, on page nine of your agenda. Glenside Downs subdivision. It's a request for concept plan approval to create 18 lots on property located on Curry Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 23, 2019 NHL 002001, on page 10 of your agenda. 1006 Monroe Street. It's a request to apply a neighborhood landmark overlay district, district on property located on Monroe Street to permit a mixture of uses. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 24, 2013 UD 002022. It's international market modification. It's a request to modify the building setback standard of the Murfreesboro Pike Urban Design Overlay District on property located on Murfreesboro Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve the request to modify the building setback. Item number 26, 2019-Z-166-PR-001. It's a request to rezone from IR to MUGA for property located at 186 North 1st Street. Staff recommendation is to approve, and I will note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number 27, 2019-Z-167-PR-001, a request to rezone from R10 to OR20A for property located at 100 and 102 Shields Lane. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 28, 2019-Z-168-PR-001 on page eight of your agenda. A request to rezone from R8 to RM20A for property located on Young's Lane. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 29, 2019-Z-169-PR-001. A request to rezone from RS20 to MUN for property located on Old Hickory Boulevard. Staff recommendation is to approve. And under other business, item number 32, a correction to the Wedgwood Houston Chestnut Hill planning study. Item 33, employee contract renewal for Stephanie McCullough. And item number 37, to accept the director's report. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items, but let's go through these and make sure that we are uh, correct on the ones that are on the consent agenda, because it has changed. So. I have on the items for the consent agenda be passed are items 5A, 5B, 7, 11, 12, 13, 18, 19, 23, 24, 26, 27, 28, 29, 32, 33, and 37. Is that correct? Yes. Commissioners, you've heard those items for the consent agenda yes. and commissioner. Could I pull uh, item number 19 just for the correction purpose? What was that now? Uh, item number 19. Yes. Commissioner, can you repeat what your motion is? Do you need yes, to I would like to pull up item number 19. Oh, you want to pull it yes. from consent? Just, I do have just a tiny bitty question. Okay, do you want to ask the question now or do you want to hear the case? I think I want to hear the case in order for me to uh, ask proper question. Okay, that's fine. And so strike item 19. It is no longer on the consent agenda. Any other items that would like, commissioners would like to strike? Okay, so let's go through the list one more time just to make sure and get it on the record. Items for consent agenda, 5A, 5B, 7, 11, 12, 13, 19, oh, excuse me, 13, 18, 23, 24, 26, 27, 28, 29, 32, 33, 37. All right. Commissioners, you've heard those items for the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve? There's a motion to approve and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those items will be on the consent agenda. And so now let's go through the items that we are going to hear. So we are going to, let, let's let everybody uh, 
circulate out of the room real quick, and then that way we it's not as loud and everybody can hear. So we'll just give everybody a second. All right, if everybody could exit out of the room, that would be great. All right, so we are going to hear for public hearing items 6, 9, 19, 20, 21, 22A and B, 25, 30, and 31. And so we are ready to hear item 6. All right, um, item six on this evening's agenda is a proposal for a text amendment um, to amend section 17.16.250 of the zoning code, um, which pertains to home occupations. A home occupation is defined as a service or profession carried out um, by a resident within a dwelling unit. There are currently standards in this section of the zoning code um, that, that regulate this use. It's permitted as an accessory use to a residence. Um, and it has um, several limitations. Um, it must be conducted by someone who lives um, in the building. They can have an employee. At the current time, um, no clients or visitors or customers are permitted on site. There are also limitations on the size, um, the portion of the unit that can be used for the home occupation, um, as well as equipment, outside storage, um, some of the uses that can occur, um, and vehicles. The proposal is to amend um, this section of the code um, by replacing it entirely with the new standards. The primary function of the new standards would be to permit customers. Oh, turn off. Turn That's there why. we go. Um, to permit customers on site um, as part of a home occupation. Staff has coordinated with um, the council member who introduced this legislation, um, as well as the codes department during our review, and is recommending approval of a substitute to avoid confusing you with three different versions of the bill. Um, my presentation is gonna focus on the substitute um, that staff is recommending, um, and then I can answer questions about how that differs from what was initially filed, if you would like that information. Um, so this will be focused on our recommendations. Um, the new standards, as I mentioned, would allow for customer visits. Um, there would continue to be some limitations on how that works. Um, so there would be limitations on the hours um, and days of the week in which customers could visit. Um, there are also limits on the number of customers per hour as well as a maximum per day and a standard that would apply if someone were interested in a group um, instruction like a, a dance lesson or a music lesson for kids. Um, the staff recommendation would also prohibit signs associated with this use, um, as well as certain more impactful uses um, that are on the screen there that could not be um, done as a home occupation. Um, and you would be required to obtain a permit um, for a home occupation if you served clients or employed someone who didn't reside on the property. Um, as you heard some of the council members speak to earlier, there have been um, a number of bills proposed um, that dealt with home occupations. All of them kind of generally focused on allowing customers or clients on site. They kind of each took a different approach to how they limited that, whether it was by use, um, by hour, um, different kinds of approaches. Um, as you'll see on the screen, those um, were ultimately withdrawn or, or disapproved. Um, those also all occurred in uh, sort of the 2010 to 2012 window, which was prior to the city's adoption of Nashville Next. Um, with Nashville Next, um, we have an economic and workforce development element of our general plan um, that focuses on overall goals for the city in that area. Um, and it recognizes the need for places, um, for businesses to locate across a variety of scales, um, as well as the benefits of being able to launch a business um, at home in terms of eliminating obstacles to entrepreneurship 
or creating an additional revenue stream that may enable people to stay um, in their homes due to that supplemental income. And so there's actually an action item in Nashville Next that suggests that rules be created that would allow home businesses in existing neighborhoods. Um, as the proposed amendments with the staff substitute um, would set up a permitting system for home occupations that allow clients. Um, it restricts visits per day and includes other limitations to try to balance the impacts of this use um, with the neighborhood character and it's consistent with the goals of Nashville Next to provide business opportunities at a variety of scales. Staff is recommending approval of a substitute. Thank you very much. And we'll open this item for public hearing. And I think the council is the councilman, the applicant, Councilman Rosenberg. You want to want to come up and present it, or do you want to go last? I'll go last. You'll go last. Okay. Uh, and so now we are on to the. Just for everyone here, this is the public hearing part, which means if you're in favor, you get two minutes to speak, and in opposition, two minutes to speak as well. So we are on to the part. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support? Come on up and, and um, like I said, everybody gets two minutes um, and then make sure you state your name and your address for the record. And then if, if you wanna speak in support, come and line up and that way it, we can keep this thing flowing. Welcome. Hey, thank you so much. My name is Elijah Shaw and I go by Lidge. And Hold on a second, I think your microphone may not be on. We it tap on? It. There we go, you just gotta talk closer. It okay. feels on. All right. Um, my name is Elijah Shaw. I go by the nickname Lidge and I live at, 2407 Brasher Avenue in East Nashville. And I have stood before the council um, previously um, in an attempt to rezone my home uh, to allow for it to include a home recording studio. And, um, and then recently I have been also fighting for my right to be able to work and make an honest living from my home. And so I'm here before you to say that I'm, I'm very excited to see that this amendment to the uh, home occupancy permit is being put before you and before the council and um, I'm very excited to see a solution to this very needed issue. Um, you know, I, I sort of stand before you representing the music community here. Uh, many of us desperately would like to be able to work from our homes and be able to support ourselves in creating music and in recording music and in supporting the music community. Nashville's music industry, um, the recording industry in particular, has really been founded upon the existence and the need for home recording studios and people to be able to get together and gather and record music professionally inside of homes, and it's expanded and become the very core of why we call it Music City here in Nashville. So I'm just in support of it. I'm very happy to see that it is being considered. I think it's incredibly important, and I think that the um, lifeblood of Nashville being able to continue with being known as Music City and being able to create the music that we're recognized for uh, w relies on the ability for people to still get together face to face in homes and create music. Thank you for coming Was that down, my sir. two minutes? That was your two minutes. Thank yes, you sir. so much for hearing me. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. And if, if, if y'all just line up in the front here, we appreciate it. And uh, thank you for coming down. And I recognize the former council member. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had requested five minutes uh, can I speak so, for so granted. All right, thank you. We appreciate you come down, Mr. Um, Summers. Appreciate the opportunity to speak. Most of y'all know that I did serve on this commission and I served in the council, served with uh, the chairman. Um, I was actually involved directly with the negotiations that got us to the current home occupation ordinance we have now. And that key issue, the key compromise was on no customers on site. So this bill will undo that compromise that was made 30 something years ago. And as you've already been told, several efforts have been made and the council has always voted this down. Um, George 
Santana said that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I hope, as Councilman Glover told you, and we're not often on the same side, that you won't repeat the past mistake that we made with short-term rentals. This bill is not ready to move forward. I have talked with the councilman about deferring even this public hearing because this was just filed in November. We met with him on the 19th of November, um, and we've committed to him to try to see if there's some way to work something out that maybe will address this issue that keeps coming back up. But the current bill does not do that. So this will be the most significant piece of legislation you may consider because it affects every, every residential property in this city unless you happen to live in Bellmead or Forest Hills or you have a homeowners association that won't allow this. The rest of us are gonna to have to live with it. So it's gonna be applied inequally to begin with. Second, there's been no community meetings by the staff that I'm aware of. The only meeting that I am aware of is the one that Councilman uh, Rosenberg came and had with us and we appreciate him doing that and we plan on meeting with him again. But I don't believe the public's aware of this because I guarantee you, you'd have a lot more people lined up here today because we're in the holidays People aren't paying attention. Um, and when you do a text change, nobody knows about it except the staff and the people involved in the development community and maybe us few neighborhood crazies like myself that keep up with this. So there really hasn't been time to address this effort. So I hope that if you don't disapprove this today that you'll at least ask Councilman Rosenberg to defer this and we keep the public hearing open. I learned a hard lesson when I was in the council. If you can't enforce your ordinances, they're not worth the paper they're written on. And this one's not worth the paper it's written on. It does nothing to change our enforcement procedure, which does not work. We still have, despite spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, four or 5,000 illegal STRs in this city right now today. Yes, there are people operating illegally in this community under a home occupation, and we all know it. The problem is if you move the goalposts, it'll be even harder to enforce because instead of enforcing a black and white issue, you're gonna force 50 shades of gray. You're gonna give these entrepreneurs an uneven level playing field. You're gonna give them an advantage to where they can compete against legitimate businesses that are paying taxes in commercial properties as the law requires, but you're gonna let them operate at an advantage. And they're not gonna pay those taxes, but they're gonna to continue to put burdens on our neighborhoods. So it's not an even playing field for those who are in business now. I respectfully disagree with the staff. You know, I participated in Nashville Next, and it was kind of one of those, everybody can send in emails and everything, and you know, so the details for many people got left aside. I don't think there was any great push in Nashville Next, I didn't see it, to change to where we can have businesses operating out of our residential neighborhoods. I never heard it. I don't know what percentage of folks may have written it in or something else and all that. I'm sure there were a few, because there's a lot of gentlemen, like the gentleman here, they want to run recording studios out of their uh, homes. Um, so there's probably some, but I don't think you had a hue and cry from the groundswell saying, give us businesses in our neighborhoods, give us businesses in our neighborhoods, please, I want a business next door. Do any of you want a business next door? Go ask your neighbors. Do they want a business next door? because I don't care what restrictions you put in here, you cannot enforce them. Trust me, time has proven that fact too many times. All due respect to the staff, and I know the staff doesn't do codes enforcement, they just do planning. But what reference you have here is just, oh, well, you know, codes are gonna issue permits, pursue it to the standards, and enforce the standards on a complaint-driven basis. That's the problem we have now. You have to force a neighbor to go out, take pictures of their neighbor, take pictures of everybody that shows up at their house. You can't do it for one day. You gotta do it for a week, two weeks. You know, a judge is not gonna make a decision on one day's photos. So you put a conflictual situation in every neighborhood anytime someone's got this permit, or potential, that's for sure. Our mayor was elected by 60% of the vote just two months ago on a neighborhood campaign. I don't think this reflects that neighborhood campaign, and I would urge you to request a deferral from the sponsor and or a disapproval. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Thank you, Ms. Summers. Hi, I'm Grace Renshaw, and I live at 220 Mockingbird Road. 
Right now, the only commercial use where customers can legally come to residences is short-term rentals. Our STR ordinance has provisions similar to those in this bill to prevent STRs from ruining the quality of life of neighbors. We legalized STRs four years ago, so they offer an informative case study of the can of worms you would open by legalizing more home businesses. Here's what we've learned. Neither codes nor police are equipped to enforce restrictions on noise or the number of guests, so they don't. Limits on the number of visits to a home business are also unenforceable. Owners of high traffic businesses will claim excess cars or personal visitors or family, leaving neighbors the impossible task of proving traffic is business related. My daughter is a tutor. She goes to students' homes when a parent is there or meets them at the public library because the liability is too great of facing a bogus he said, she said sexual allegation. It amazed me that Councilman Rosenberg's bill prohibits hotels as a home occupation when Metro has allowed property investors to fill neighborhoods all over Nashville with legal and illegal STRs at the expense of the quality of life, safety, security, and peace and quiet enjoyed by actual residents. This bill will increase the number of abusive businesses in neighborhoods and its protections against that abuse are unenforceable. At a time when Metro is struggling with myriad bad consequences of offering an unlimited number of non-owner occupied STR permits in multifamily complexes and the STR industry is encouraging hosts to incorporate other business offerings into STR stays, we need to focus on fixing the problems we have and not create new ones. Residential neighborhoods should be for residents and 10 visits a day is totally impossible to track and unenforceable. Please oppose this bill. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Come on up. Welcome. Thank you. I'm uh, Logan Key, and I reside at 1411 Fatherland Street in East Nashville. Uh, I want to I want to make a couple of points here. First of all, uh, Councilman Rosenberg did uh, meet with our group, and, and we were very grateful for that. We did leave that meeting. Our a number of our members left that meeting thinking that. Uh, a, a deferral was probably imminent, and so we're a bit surprised uh, to be here today, uh, willing to and glad to, but we were anticipating, or at least some of our members were, were absolutely anticipating a deferral. One member in particular has told me that uh, at least three times in the last, uh, in the last few days. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize is that one thing I think our Coast Department actually does pretty well is land use enforcement. Uh, and so when we talk about land uses uh, falling into one of a number of different categories, I think that is, is not a perfect set of enforcement. Uh, uh, it's not a perfect enforcement climate, but I think they do that quite well. We, we run into problems when we start nuancing things, when we start trying to write into the, into the zoning code how many customers or how many visits. Those are very impractical for our uh, code staff to enforce, whereas land use, either it's being used for this or it's not, is much more straightforward. I also want to remind you that we already have on the books, as you are well aware, we already have OR zoning. And OR zoning is well suited for those persons who want to uh, either uh, live and or work uh, from, from uh, some kind of facility that can, can cross into both territories. And there's a participatory process around that with zoning changes. Uh, last thing I want to say is this. Keep in mind, when we talk about expanding uses of property with text changes, we fail to serve our community uh, under the zoning process because the signs don't go up on the neighborhood to announce a public hearing. It doesn't work that way with a text change. It's just done. And for that reason, when we talk about expanding the zoning code to expand uses for residential areas, I think we do our citizens who live here a disservice and it's going to hit the urban core the hardest because we don't have HOAs. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Pat Williams. I live at 4301 Elkins Avenue. I won't repeat. I would just like to echo everything that has been said, most especially every word that John said about enforcement. It is not fair to burden neighbors with having to enforce things like this. We have fought so long and so hard to keep commercial entities out of our neighborhoods. Please, please do not approve this. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. 
Twanachik, 5967 Cambridge Road. Uh, I would agree that not having public notice on this is a great disservice to the community. In my 28 years of police experience here with Metro Nashville, some of our most difficult calls were about businesses and homes, specifically recording studios. If a person spends tens of thousands of dollars to put a recording studio in their home, and it is allowed, then we're gonna have a very difficult time trying to do any kind of enforcement. It's very uh, unfair to the codes department as well to add that burden. Some of the most difficult calls I had were over on Granny White Pike in some of the upper areas. Um, and again, it was really a, a difficult situation. Currently, going forwards, I have a recording studio in my neighborhood out in the general services area of Cane Ridge that is not enforceable. It's advertised as being a recording studio and as recently as October, we had multiple conversations with our new councilman Rutherford about this problem. Um, this would add another layer of them saying, but I have a permit, I'm a permitted use, and would make it even more difficult when they were doing music at 2 a.m. Uh, and I would submit to you that codes is not available for enforcement at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, we already have things like garages next door that are unenforceable. So where we have unenforceable stuff, we shouldn't be adding more to it. And then we have the problem of the noise ordinance, especially if we're talking about recording studios. Uh, how are we going to say that it's permissible and yet also enforce the noise ordinance at the same time? And that citizens also would have no recourse when there are problems. Uh, again, going back to if somebody puts tens of thousands of dollars into that business, we're probably not going to be able to make them take it out. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? All right, seeing none, Councilman, you're up. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you. You kind of got to talk close. I apologize. I'll, I'll lean. I'll be You're a leaner. little taller than. All right. <laughs> uh, thank you all for the opportunity to speak tonight, uh, and thank you to everybody who came tonight to express their thoughts about this amendment. Um, I think it's first to, important to acknowledge how much of the argument against this amendment is colored by the short-term rental issue, um, and that's both understandable and unfortunate. There are two distinct reasons why that comparison does not apply. First, please note. Notice how few people came to speak in support tonight. Why so few? Because nobody stands to get rich off this. No burgeoning industry has hired teams of lobbyists to draw people out and fight for this. The Nashvillians this amendment will benefit are largely those seeking to better their communities and in fact stay in their communities. Math tutors, piano teachers, entrepreneurs, Nashvillians far from wealthy, needing to make a few extra dollars on the side to make ends meet. Second, we have regulations on home occupation already. We're not adding a new section of code to burden the codes department or to burden neighbors. In fact, each argument about how difficult this, this amendment is applies to our current code as well. The quick version of what's before you is this. This amendment would allow a specific set of non-invasive home-based businesses to operate subject to restrictions that pr protect residential neighborhoods. More specifically, a business could only operate if the number of clients visiting the house is severely limited, if there's no evidence of the business's operation outside the building's walls, if there's no noise, no commercial deliveries, no commercial vehicles, or other traits that could detract from the neighborhood. I'm grateful for the help of planning staff from codes, the council office, interested parties, including neighborhood advocates, in constructing legislation in a way that balances those of us who demand our residential neighborhoods remain residential, and those who want to provide enrichment opportunities for our city's children, who need to earn a supplemental income to offset our city's exploding cost of living, and work from home at a computer all day and not bothering anybody but need a client to drop off papers once in a blue moon. This is a great opportunity for our constituents and it's undebatably the right time to do it. I'd appreciate your consideration. I remain open to suggestions. I look forward to future conversations on how to make this legislation the best it can be. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilman. really appreciate you coming down. All right, seeing no one else switching to speak, we'll, I declare the public hearing closed and Commissioner Blackshear, you wanna go first? So this is a question for staff. 
Um, so it looks like I'm just trying to get straight what the difference is between the substitute bill that you presented and what we already allow. So it's just the addition of the clients being able to visit the home business, is that it? That is the primary difference. Um, there are some tweaks to the standard that limits the size of the amount of the home that you can use. Um, I think, let me quote it instead of getting it wrong. I think it's currently, um, here, I'll go back. 20% um, to a max of 500, and the new proposal would be 20% to a max of 1,000. Okay. Thank you. And then I would say the, the new proposal is more robust in terms of the uses that it prohibits, um, as well as some of the restrictions on the operational characteristics. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Sure, so under the current bill, um, you can't do auto repair, transportation equipment repair. Um, under the proposed um, bill, there's a, there's a long list of things that are prohibited. Um, so some of them are listed on this slide, but it would include um, after hours establishments, um, any business primarily engaged in retail sales, um, anything that's industrial, medical, transportation, utility, or waste management uses in the zoning table, um, automobile repair and service, um, bars or nightclubs, better breakfast in, funeral home, hotel, major appliance repair, restaurant, um, and short-term rental properties. So are you comparing the substitute bill to what was originally proposed? or comparing the substitute to, bill to what was already in place? To the current zoning code standards. Gotcha. Okay. Um, the substitute bill had a, or the original proposal by the council member had a list of uses um, that would be prohibited. Um, staff recommended that a couple more be added just to ensure it compre was comprehensive. Gotcha. I mean, it sounds like, and was slightly confusing because we have multiple bills and also we have legislation that is currently on the books that talks about how home businesses should be operated. Um, but it sounds like the overall goal of the proposed legislation is to increase commercial activity in residential neighborhoods, whether, and I'm not making a judgment call right now about whether it's a good idea or not good idea, but even though there's a more robust list of things that are prohibited, the idea would be to allow an increase in certain forms of commercial activity in residential neighborhoods. I think it's it certainly allows a different character of commercial activity. So you can have a home occupation now. Um, the difference is that um, customers would be able to come to the site. Gotcha, thank you. Um, it is interesting to hear this after the hubbub regarding STRs. The councilman is correct. I mean, a lot of the um, the opposition specifically referenced STRs in their opposition to it, um, but I don't think that that's necessarily off base. I mean, I, I don't think that the STR is going to be representative of the type of business that would generally be um, a home business. We're talking about studios or um, hair salons or um, piano lessons. But I do think it could be informative to think about what type of increased commercial activity, specifically allowing people who are not residents of a neighborhood um, regular access to a home, how that would affect the neighborhood character. Um, I do really appreciate the proponent who wants to operate a home studio. I think probably everybody in here has gotten their hair done or hair cut in someone's home before. So we've all participated in a home business um, <laughs> illegally. <laughs> Unless they were a relative, I mean, it doesn't count, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, if you have to pay, it does count. Um, but I, I am sensitive to the neighbors who don't want an increased amount of visits on a commercial basis to their um, 
to their to their neighborhoods. Um, it makes sense. You try to be empathetic. You try to look at the policies. You try to think about what planning um, policies are correct. And you also try to be empathetic when you're thinking about that. And from a planning policy, is it good to increase commercial activity in um, residential areas? I mean, it certain, certainly can make sense in some situations. And I'm sure there are a lot of good actors where increasing commercial activities in those residential areas would not disturb the character of a neighborhood, but um, we know that not everyone is a great actor, and so what is what is likely to happen if we were to um, allow this bill to move forward and become legislation that actually is effective? And I just, I mean, I think it is a balancing act, but if I were to think about it both from a planning perspective and then in light of the things that have gone on, in recent past Davidson County, I would be, I think the scales in my opinion um, are in favor of not allowing this. So I would be in favor, and I don't think that there's necessarily no way for this legislation um, to be drafted in a way that perhaps could be um, more, uh, I, don't, I don't wanna say more friendly, but it, drafted in a way that would be preferable for the neighborhoods and particularly the neighbors who came and spoke today. So I'm not sure if I would be in favor of a deferral or complete disapproval, but I would not be in favor of moving it forward. Commissioner Tibbs. So um, is there any um, restrictions to like how many that uh, I think this, and I do think we are all jaded by the STRs because now that's been such a, you know, because that's been our primary conversation the past couple of years, but is there any, um, like, is, would there be anything preventing if every person on a street decided to have a home business, or is that is that anywhere in here at all? Too many things to bump. Um, so there is not, we the, the substitute um, would limit the permit availability to one per lot which addresses some of the, the questions that come up when we have um, duplex lots with, with individual units on it. Um, but it doesn't include any standards that regulate the number of permits per area or per street that are available. Okay. So, so I guess from a, um, much of what um, Commissioner Blackshear said, a lot more eloquently, but I do feel like that's a little bit more of a concern that we would um, the community fabric would get, could you know, could get tore up. You know, um, I think of Berry Hill now, which is almost totally business, but you know, communities like that where just a, a home business could just kind of take over a street. But I, I do want to say I'm, a, I'm still conflicted on this a lot because I know we could be because of the STRs, which I know we shouldn't necessarily bring it up in this conversation, but we will lie on STR all over that neighborhood, but yet, um, you know, um, someone who does hair, who maybe has, you know, four customers that day, uh, can't have their business now. So whereas these, you know, people who are doing STRs can have their business all over the place. So I am conflicted that we are, we're allowing one, but we're not allowing the other, which in essence may even have less home, you know, cars. But the the issue I'd have, and, um, and maybe that's why, maybe there's still some more work that could be done with it. I, I would hate for a, you know, with this legislation, just take over, take over your know, neighborhood and there would be no stopping it. Um, it, it the, the person that came up that was for it, and I, I do remember, I think, when the last time he came, but and he makes a good, you know, I hate that this does impact a lot of the home um, studios, because that is a big part of Nashville. Um, and, you know, a lot of people will put a studio and do things with it. And, a lot, you know, a lot of times they're even mixing down, so they're not even necessarily have people there. But uh, that this we can't necessarily preclude, and all of a sudden a street is full of um, studios. So as it's written now, just because of the potential impact of it, I think I couldn't go forward with it. Um, but, I, you know, I can't say I'm totally opposed to it because of just the nature of it but I just would like some kind of control of it. Council Lady. Thank you. Um, let me get some clarification on parts of this. This is for the, this is 
currently a home occupation is an accessory use. Yes, and it still would be classified that way. So this would be an accessory use to a residential unit. So right now, like my entire block could have home offices in it currently. As long as there are no customers, um, that would be compliant with the code as it stands. Okay. So I will say that, um, you know, I, I mean, prior to a year ago, I worked out of my home. Um, and it was really the only way I would have been able to afford to run my personal business. Uh, I grew up with my mother working out of the, working from home, and that's really how she was kind of a quote unquote stay at home mom most of the year with us. Um, I see a lot of benefits to this to, very similar to the piano lessons that I took illegally, I guess, uh, as well. Um, but so I, I see some, a lot of benefits to, um, just the everyday Nashvilleian who has an occupation that they can save, you know, anywhere from a thousand or twenty-three hundred or more. That they, if we, if we are not allowing them to work out of their home, they're forced to find space. And we know that rent is ridiculous. I can only assume that commercial space is equally ridiculous in pricing. I've seen some head nods. Of people who probably know a little bit more than me. Um, so, so I, while I think the. Um, I, I've kind of toyed around within my head, is it better to have listed uses that would be okay for this rather than uses that are not okay here? I think this is a pretty good list of things that would not be allowed to do this. I mean, obviously you don't want a funeral home next to your house um, or sex club or whatnot, but I, I think that maybe, um, maybe that's an area that we could find some more compromise with the with the neighborhoods to just maybe exclude some more uses there. Um, and I think, also, there needs to be a little bit more thought, I think, with the, um, um, if we talk about like a dance studio, that clearly is gonna be different than the residential character. I mean, even though it's on the inside, you're clearly turning like where my home office is a spare bedroom, it would then become not a spare bedroom, it becomes a probably a bar, you know, ballet bar or whatever in there. So um, I think that that's something that could be addressed through the permitting process with codes as well as when they go in to submit their, to get their permit to renovate or whatnot, that could be tightened up there potentially. Um, so I guess, I, I mean, I'm, it sounds like I'm a little bit more comfortable than some of the other uh, commissioners at this point. But so to Councilman Rosenberg, um, you've clearly had a community meeting or a quasi community meeting with the neighborhood coalition. Um, and this does go before council and have public hearing there too, right? Cause it's, even though it's a text change, are you willing to commit that if there are other changes, significant changes, bringing it back to the commission or holding it? I mean, I guess I could hold it up in, in the planning committee, but can you, what are you willing to do for some more community engagement? I'd like to have as much engagement on this as possible as if it moves forward from here. I mean, like you mentioned, everything would be remaining uh, an accessory use and we're not changing any any character outside the home, but I do want to make sure people are comfortable with it. Um, so we'll have the, pub if it moves forward from here, um, we would have the public hearing on second, uh, public hearing on second reading at council. Um, if there are any changes, I'd like to bring it back to the planning commission. And if there are any changes between second and third reading also, have an additional public hearing at council in addition to whatever meetings take place in the community. Thank you, and so just to clarify our rules here, because we just passed our rules there, so I don't wanna get them confused. When you, when, like we just closed the public hearing here, um, would we have to, if we then deferred this bill tonight, um, would the public hearing be reopened? Is that a motion we would have to make? Um, We've done done both, but generally we, um, we like to open the public hearing back for, okay. because you know, generally it would, have changes in it and we, we want the public the feedback input. feedback at that. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I feel, I think that there are some more tweaks and things that could, that should probably be handled because really when we think about like, so my first meeting we had the, I think it was Council Lady Henderson's as short term rental legislation come through and it kind of just flowed right through here because it was more the regulations of a, of a existing use. This is an existing use that's out there too. And we're not necessarily making, um, we're not creating a new use. And so I think some of these, some of these tweaks that, I would like to see are a little bit more of a political compromise among neighbors 
um, that might be more appropriate at the council level rather than here with the with the land use um, because it's not making it 100 percent a commercial property um, it, it is a little bit they are still commercial uses but again it's permitted already so i think this is almost more of a political question for the council um, and now I'm sounding like the finance director that was before us the other night telling us that all the budget things are up to the council. Um, and so, so that's just maybe what I'd like to hear some more comments and think through. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Um, this, I think, you know, intention is good. I mean, who doesn't like a piano teacher right next to your house and then send your kid? So I think intention comes with good, but my concern is, enforcement and where, what are we not thinking, unintended consequences. I mean, I don't wanna you know, compare this with short-term rental, but when, you know, as a planning commissioner, we recommended short-term rental, we thought it was a good according to Nashville Next, because one of the Nashville Next of the uh, core uh, principle is uh, economic uh, workforce development. So introducing some short-term rental, you know, where people can stay home and then uh, make extra business and extra money sounds innocent and really good. And who would imagine it would be so bombarded with industry? And so this home business sounds very innocent, very convenient, but do we, are we feel okay with open up every single residential zone to allow customer visit? Personally, I'm not there yet. I mean, some uh, area, it might be good, mixed use, hustle and bustle, and next door neighbor will be expected. But some neighborhood may not be expected maximum of 10 visitor by day, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. And so if it's coded, the next door neighbor coded with a permit, they have to, whomever in the, happen to be next door, have to endure those, you know, added noise, added customer, added traffic. And who are we to say this house is okay, but this house is not? It, because this, uh, uh, you know, text amendment apply to entire Davidson County, so we cannot say uh, this area is okay, this area is not, it's not okay, because it applies to every single residential zoning area. So as of right now, if we were to recommend uh, one, uh, my recommendation will be defer, and I understand, you know, council, as uh, Council Lady Murphy says, it might be political, but it applies to land use policy. If we were to amend this tax amendment, we are essentially changing land use. So I would like to see uh, Council Member Rosenberg uh, engage with the community and bring back a uh, more robust community engagement and then bring more a uh, palatable substitute, not current substitute, have you know robust community engagement, and then bring us more appropriate uh, amendment, then we can recommend or not. So uh, if we were to recommend, uh, I'm leaning towards uh, either deferring it or disapproving it. Commissioner Moore. So I agree with much that has already been said. Um, I know growing up, I took in-home piano lessons and I can think of a number of other instances where this is a really good idea and it could really work. Um, but then on the other hand, I can see the abuse, especially in those neighborhoods without HOAs um, that don't have a way to kind of um, uh, limit the use. And um, I definitely have four of those neighborhoods that um, this would affect. Um, have concerns of how it would be enforced. Um, I think if you have all these houses that can potentially have this use, there's no way to check on all of them um, to make sure that they're working within these restrictions and parameters. Um, so much like everyone else, I am leaning towards a deferral or um, disapproval. Commissioner Gavel. I agree uh, with the other commissioners. I don't think this is enforceable at all. Uh, we're in a, an area where uh, with shrinking resources, 
and we're gonna try to ask somebody to spend 11 hours to see if 10 people showed up. Uh, that doesn't, I don't think you could ever get there uh, in that aspect. I, uh, I think the concept of revising and tuning our, our work, work at home thing is a good idea. I would certainly am sympathetic to the music industry. Uh, I started our, our firm from my house uh, illegally, but I think the statute of limitation has run. Uh, but the, uh, you know, I think the, um, I think this is something that we all defer, and certainly when we come back, we have a clear understanding of how do you enforce it and how do you pay for that enforcement, and how do you respect these neighborhoods that really uh, don't you know, that, that really don't, how do you respect it? How do you control this thing? So that's my opinion. Commissioner Sims. I so appreciate my colleagues here because I agree with almost everything all of them have said and questions they've asked. Um, I, I would like for us just to kind of, I would like to go on record that we actually have a lot more letters here than we had people speaking against this. And so I think there's quite a, a robust voice out there trying to get us to slow down and really think through this thing. Um, I think really good policy always, always includes implementation. And if it doesn't have strong implementation, then it's not good public policy. And in this case, I think we all agree that the implementation of this public policy has not yet been determined in a way that we can either afford it or it makes it um, not a burden on communities. I think the other thing is, I think we're living in an environment right now where we probably need a more narrow definition of, um, of residential rather than a broader one. And in neighborhoods I know are, for many reasons, and I don't think it's just short-term rentals, for many reasons are feeling overwhelmed with what's coming at them. And I think we have to slow down. The other thing that really gets me is when we have a swampy problem like this, and it's not something either mandated in policy, I fall back on our code of ethics for the American Planning Association, and it says that our job is to make sure the public has a voice in planning, not just in legislating. And so for me, I want them to have more of a voice. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, before, uh, there's been a lot of discussion around deferral, so I, I always really try to give the, the council member a lot of leeway. Councilman, if, would you be for a deferral or, or, or how do you, how do you? Thank you. Um, I, I, I sense you know how the wind is blowing here. I do, and I appreciate the discussion. I came, I think, with the wrong set of arguments. My understanding was, was that the role of the Planning Commission versus the Council was to discuss the land use policy and not the policy implement, uh, implications, and that codes, which is charged with enforcing this, um, you know, since they came with no concerns about it, and the fact that codes already has to enforce these regulations, and this, in fact, removes enforcement burden from codes rather than adding to it. I think that, uh, you know, if, so do if you the wanna... plan commission is concerned with the policy, you know, the political policy versus the land use policy, then I think it would be appropriate to defer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so now we're on to, thank you, Council. I really appreciate your, your comments. Um, so now we're on to a motion. We'll need a motion. So we, we can either, Councilman's okay with deferral, or we can go ahead and. Can I say something? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, we're still on discussion, so okay. Commissioner. Um, just to what the Councilman just said, um, I wasn't basing my decision on political policy. I mean, I was thinking about planning and whether it'd be smart to increase commercial activity in a residential neighborhood. So, I mean, I appreciate the councilman's words about the the um, the charge of the planning commission. I don't want him to think that we have abandoned our responsibility as it relates to planning and land use policy. Very good comment as well. Any any other discussion or is there is it a commissioner ready to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Um, as we know at the council, sometimes by slowing down, you can get there faster or reach a better conclusion. Um, and so I'm willing to make the motion to defer this and kind of looking to the councilman for a head nod of how many head nods? Two, three, I can't, I'm losing, I can't see that far. No, <laughs> two, would two meeting, one meeting give you enough time, do you feel, or would you prefer two, two planning meetings? Three planning meetings. So I don't know what that, if somebody else could calculate that, I can make that motion to. 
books. I guess it's in our books. Second, yeah. second meeting in February. So I, I would defer this to February 27th planning meeting the that's at meeting. Bransford Avenue. That's a proper motion to the second meeting in February. Is there, is there a second? Second. A second. Any other discussion? All in favor of deferral, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. This bill is deferred. And I'm going to hand the, the chair over to Commissioner Blackshear. Come on over. All right, we're ready for item number nine. The next item on this evening's agenda is item nine. This is the Rosedale Avenue SP. This is a request to permit a mixed use development Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The site is currently zoned R6, which requires a minimum 6,000 square foot lot and is intended for single family dwellings and duplexes. The site contains 0 0.73 acres and is located at 538 Rosedale Avenue at the intersection of Rosedale Avenue and Waycross. The site contains one single family structure Rosedale Avenue is classified as a collector street by the major and collector street plan and traverses the site in an east-west direction. Waycross Drive is designated as a local street and traverses the site at the corner in a north-south direction. The surrounding land uses consist of single, two-family, and multi-family uh, residential uses. A small area of light industrial warehouse use is located immediately adjacent to the site, just to the north in the commercial pud identified um, where the mouse is right now. The policy for this site is T4 uh, mixed use neighborhood, which is intended to maintain, enhance, and create mixed use neighborhoods with a development pattern that contains a variety of housing, along with mixed use, commercial, institutional, and light industrial development. The plan calls for a mixed use development, including a maximum of eight multifamily residential units, a maximum of 5,820 square feet of retail space. The plan consists of a single structure with a maximum height of three stories and 35 feet. A single point of access will be provided from Rosedale Avenue as shown on the plan. Parking consists of two modules of surface parking located behind the proposed structure. A total of 31 spaces are provided within the site. The plan includes an eight foot sidewalk and four foot grass strip along Rosedale Avenue and a five foot wide sidewalk and four foot wide grass planting strip along Waycross Drive. Landscape buffers are provided along the north and west property lines. The plan will also contain architectural standards pertaining to, but not limited to, glazing, materials, raised foundations, and elevations will be required with the middle of the final site plan. The plan calls for a mixed use development that would provide additional density and housing options as well as commercial space at the corner of Waycross and Rosedale Avenue. As proposed, the plan is consistent with the T4 mixed use policy and therefore staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. Okay, so that concludes the staff presentation. We will open the item up for public hearing. Is the applicant here? So you know the drill, 10 minutes, two minutes for rebuttal. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. My name is Michael Garrigan. I'm with Dale and Associates, 516 Heather Place. Um, we're representing the owners of the property on this project. 
Um, as Patrick stated, just to reiterate a few things, this property is bound by OR20 zoning to the west, um, some light industrial to the north, and some townhomes across the street. And looking at that in conjunction with the uh, urban mixed-use neighborhood policy, um, we met early on with Councilman Sledge and with staff to figure out what would be the, the best use. This is actually our second or third version of this. Um, as early, as early on, Councilman Sledge made it clear he wanted no activity or access or anything off of Waycross, wanted everything focused along Rosedale Avenue, uh, as it is the Collector Street. Um, I met some of the neighbors tonight um, and heard some of their oppositions that have to do with traffic and, and stormwater. Um, it was the first of us hearing of this, um, but uh, we look forward to continue working through, with them through the council process. Um, and, and hopefully, especially with the stormwater issues, because um, I'm very familiar, our office is right around the corner from this uh, site and very familiar with the property. And um, one, of the, one of the main problems I think can be easily fixed uh, from a stormwater standpoint. We look forward to working through that and um, continuing to meet with the neighbors and we ask for your approval. Thank you. Thank you. So is there anyone else here wishing to speak in support? If not, is there anyone here wishing to speak in opposition? If you could line up at the front, everyone gets two minutes to speak. You could start by saying your name and address. Oh, sorry. My name is Marvin Neely. I do not reside adjoining this property on the west side across uh, Waycross, but my wife and I have owned that property for an extended number of years. The gentleman referred to industrial in the rear. There's no access off of Waycross as I've driven down to that property. And one of the major things that we're thinking about here, and I'm tickled to death that you folks have been discussing neighborhoods, because this is exactly what this is doing. It's encroaching on a residential area. No, I mean, even an old man like me can figure that out because it's coming up Rosedale. You've got nice property on either side, across the street and to the uh, east side. And it, it just seems a shame that we're again, I don't know if it's the sake of taxes or what we're doing it for, but we're definitely going against retaining any semblance of neighborhoods in the city of Nashville. And I hope that this commission will give it serious thought before you run down the track and say, oh, well, you know, they needed that there. Think about how many more housing units are going to be when they say they're going to build eight versus R6 zoning. Think about the traffic. All hours of the day or night can be if they put in a restaurant or a bar or whatever. It just doesn't make common sense. And I sincerely appreciate the consideration that I've sat back there and heard you folks give, and I trust that you will give this the same deliberation and look at it and don't create another Berry Hill. Keep a neighborhood. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your listening to me, and vote in my favor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next person can come up. Say your name and your address, please. You have two minutes. My name is Beulah Boatman. I live at 2211 Rosehaven. I've been there since 1977. And the traffic, I've got pictures, but the traffic on Rosedale, the other day when I was decorating a mailbox at my son's house, there was a lady with a stroller and two kids walking where there's no sidewalks. And there's no plans of any sidewalks because of the houses that were built there because of the water issue. So my thing is just what he said. It's a neighborhood. It's been a neighborhood all these years. And why mess up our neighborhood with who knows what's going to be put in there? So I'm opposed to that. <laughs> Thank you. My name's John Swanner. I lived on 504 Waycross Drive for 56 years. 
And uh, that's been a great neighborhood, but they are destroying the neighborhood with all this rezoning, trying to bring in this retail. There is no other retail on Rosedale. Uh, a three-story building um, is an eyesore. You have to think about the safety, about the children riding their bicycles up and down Waycross. The elderly, they got plenty of elderly has been there 60 plus years. If they need a medical assistance, they can't get it in the afternoon because of the traffic so backed up. And it's just a sin what they're doing to our neighborhood, they're destroying it for all the progress and the mighty dollar. And I think it's a sin. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Swanner. I live at 504 Waycross, Waycross Drive, Nashville, Tennessee. I'm against this. I'm totally against this. It breaks my heart to see what you're doing to neighborhoods. With all the children have no place to play, people, the elderly neighbors that have been in this neighborhood are being forced out for some kind of progress. I don't understand why. I'm just totally, totally against this. It upsets me to think that nobody ever listens to the residents. So I'm against it. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Bennett Burnside. I live at 538 Rosedale with uh, Jared, my roommate back there. Uh, my family moved to Nashville when I was about 11. So I grew up there, went to school there, just around the corner, actually at NSA. And um, it's been a great city. And you know, one thing not a lot of people are who are opposed to these bills are saying is that progress is a good thing, because it is. Change is good, growth is good. I think that's how humans are made. But there's a difference between thoughtful, courteous, forward-thinking progress and quick, inconsiderate progress, and consider the people that have been there, that have, that have built this city, that have made it what it already is. And I play music for a living. Um, many of my friends, you know, there's more and more money in Nashville and fewer and few, excuse me, less and less money for musicians. And so they're moving farther and farther out. A lot of them are moving to Antioch, to Hendersonville, all the way out to Bellevue. And so this, I mean, for obvious reason, I don't want to have this, this torn down, you know, it's where I live, but, but there are a few places like this that, that I really think are worth considering all the pros and cons, and is it is it really forward thinking or progress, or is it just helping out one side? And all things considered, I mean, I, I, I think it's good to consider all the facts and really think about that question realistically and, and uh, go from there. So I'm opposed to it, um, that's about it. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Before my time starts, I do have some uh, <laughs> signatures of the neighborhood, and here's a picture of the traffic. Do y'all want to? You can give that to staff. Right there. Let's see. Here's one more project. <clears throat> okay, my name is Paul Stewart, and I live at 542 Rosedale with my wife, Bridget. The property was bought back in 1953 by my parents. We raised 14 children there with one bathroom. <laughs> but... Uh, We've been there 66 years, right next door to the property at 538. We'll be most affected by it. Okay, just down the street on Waycross, we have a resident named Mary Greer who has lived there for the last 65 years in the same house. 65 years, think about that. This neighborhood is full of long-term residents. I can go on and on and on. There's a guy back here in support of us. Jerry Greer lives on Rosehaven, 62 years. Uh, Gail and Jimmy Burke on Herwood, 45 years. Uh, Miss Vance on Rosedale, 57 years. This neighborhood is so loaded with long-term residents. And uh, we all want just to live in a quiet neighborhood with less traffic, with less noise, with less congestion, less drainage problems, and less storm runoff. 
which we have a problem on Rosedale. It's on record. I've talked to a, a guy over at Stormwater named David Johnson back in March, and he knows about it. And uh, there's an engineer named Ricky Swift. I think they came out to uh, our property, and it, especially next door at 538. Water just pours down our yards, and uh, they, they tell me there's no funding for it. So members of the Planning Commission and any Metro Council members that are here, you have on record the signatures of our neighborhood who oppose this request. Listen to the voices of the neighborhood and not just one new property owner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? If not, applicant, you have two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Michael Garrigan, Dale & Associates, 516 Heather Place. Um, you know, listening to that, it, talking to my client, I think, you know, we can address the stormwater issues. We can, we can do what we can for the traffic. There's gonna be new sidewalks, things like that. But it sounds to me like we, we probably need to take a breath and meet with them. Uh, so I would like to ask for a uh, deferral to the January 16th meeting, I believe. Uh, we'll convene out in the lobby and come up with a good time to meet with everybody and discuss the issues. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess we would declare the public hearing closed and then someone can make a motion for the deferral. All right. I declare the public hearing closed. Does anyone want to make a motion for that deferral that the applicant just requested? Uh, make a motion to defer a case until uh, January 16th meeting. Okay. Great. Any discussion? All right, let's vote. All in favor of the motion for deferral, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. It will be deferred as requested. All right, so we are going to do another item. We might take a break after this one, but we're gonna move forward. So staff, whenever you're... <laughs> it was good. Okay, whenever you're ready, staff, we're ready for you. Good evening. The next item on tonight's agenda is a concept plan application for a subdivision. The request is to create 18 cluster lots on 5.3 acres of land. <coughs> Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions. The property is zoned RS10 and is surrounded by RS10 zoning. The plan calls for 18 lots on a proposed local street. There is a stream bu uh, buffer along the northern boundary and this pushes the rear lot lines of the lots north of the proposed street inwards to the site. A landscape buffer is being provided around the perimeter of the site as required when utilizing the cluster lot option adjacent to existing residential subdivisions. And the open space of this cluster lot subdivision is to the very east of the property. This proposal is for a cluster lot subdivision and is permitted under the existing entitlements. No rezoning is proposed with this application. The cluster lot subdivision does not allow for more density than what would otherwise be allowed for under the RS10 zoning district. The cluster lot subdivision does allow for reduction in lot size to work with existing topography and to create open space. The lot area in a cluster lot subdivision can be uh, reduced down to zoning districts. So this site is zoned RS10 and they are proposing to cluster down to minimum lot size of 5,000 square feet. In a cluster lot subdivision, a, min a minimum of 15% of the development must be set aside as open space. This plan proposes 1.2 acres of open space with, which constitutes 22.6% of the site. 
The subdivision was reviewed against the subdivision regulations and the proposed subdivision meets all the minimum standards for the zoning district. All reviewing agencies have recommended approval or approval with conditions. Staff recommends to approve with conditions. Thank you. Thank you. So that concludes the staff presentation. Is the applicant here? So 10 minutes and two minutes for rebuttal, if you so choose. I appreciate it. I'm Roy Dale with Dale and Associates, 516 Heather Place. It's been a while since I've seen you guys. I know you've missed me. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> this uh, property actually has a little bit of a history. Last year, almost a year ago, we submitted a plan to the Planning Commission to do an SP on this property. There's probably 24 sore, sore cottage units. It had mixed reviews with the Planning Commission. I think y'all barely approved it, as I recall. And um, so I went to council. We sort of had a uh, absentee council member and it's sort of it just languished. At the end of the council term, uh, we met with the community just to see if they wanted to proceed with the zone change that had been started or to just go do a base subdivision. The community basically said, we just prefer to set subdivision. And so after the council election, I submitted a subdivision plan. It was probably back in October. Uh, I contacted the council member. I told him I'd be willing to defer this until he had a community meeting, which we had the community meeting. I think that was a week or two ago. And so I hear I come for you today with a plan that doesn't require a zone change request. This is under the current zoning. It's a perfunctory process. It's a subdivision that meets all the requirements of a subdivision, an RS-10 cluster lot subdivision. It's approved by all uh, the staff, recommended approval of the staff and all the different agencies of Metro. And based upon that, I'd simply ask for you to recommend approval of the subdivision. I'll hold back. If you want to speak. Okay. So I'll keep two minutes in, in case I need to rebut. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else here wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, is there anyone else here wishing to speak in opposition? That's right. So we'll close the item for public hearing. And um, Commissioner Johnson, you had questions. Yes, thank you. I do appreciate that. Uh, I remember this case because it was a literally kind of idle. Uh, it stalled uh, in our previous council for nearly a year. And so my, because this is now uh, applied as a subdivision regulation, so we do not have any community input. So I just wanted to make sure community is comfortable and indeed this concept plan is harmonious with uh, community. And also when we discuss or approve uh, subdivision regulation, we need to consider uh, health, safety, and welfare of the community. So just wanted to be assured as a commissioner, this uh, cluster uh, conceptual plan will not have any safety issue or negative issue with surrounding community. So if you, uh, staff can uh, talk on that, that would be great. The proposal meets the zoning code requirements for a cluster law and it meets the subdivision regulations and all agencies have recommended approval. So uh, additional question is, so it doesn't, so when uh, actual uh, final plan will come up to, because this is a conceptual plan, so final plan will come back to uh, your staff, correct? Uh, uh, plan, the uh, subdivision process is a three-step process the, f for this type of subdivision. The first is a concept plan. It comes here um, for determination that it meets the subdivision regulations. A final site plan is the next step, and that's when detailed construction drawings are, pr are proposed. Um, so long as that is consistent with the concept plan, it is a staff approval, uh, administrative approval. Uh, and then the final plat is the third step, and that's when the lots are actually created. Uh, if there's any bonding that's required for the public infrastructure, it takes place at that time. So additional question is uh, because uh, the mayor's initiative, you know, we were to plant a half million trees by 2050. If this uh, subdivision, those initiative uh, uphold those kind of uh, mayor's initiative or is up to uh, the developer? They will be required to meet any tree standards that are in the zoning code. That's required of all subdivisions. 
So when it, uh, final uh, subdivision uh, plot recording comes up, uh, those uh, tree density requirements and infill development grading uh, requirement, all this uh, small specific issue they have to, whomever develop will have to follow. They'll have to meet the stormwater regulations. They will submit detailed grading plans to the stormwater division, and they will review those against all of the adopted regulations of Metro. Thank you. Well, one, uh, we appreciate uh, you know all this uh, uh, information, and it is good to hear uh, 24. Uh, reduced to 18, I think it would be more uh, palatable to community. So that's a one good uh, change I can see. Uh, it is unfortunate though, because it is great to hear from the council member, especially the subdivision regulation, uh, because community are really you know, embraced with the plan and it's harmonious with the neighborhood and so forth. But uh, I, what I'm here it seems like meet every single requirement uh, for us to make a determination. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Oh, do, would you like to speak, Council Lady? I do. I have a question. Can you go back a slide or to the one that talked about road frontage or the lot frontage? Um, yes. So uh, the proposed lots have frontage on a proposed public street. So I'm assuming that the I call it a cul-de-sac. I'm not sure. Everybody has different terms I learned. Um, so is that a private road or a public road? That's a new public road. It would be a new public road. Yes. Okay, so the so like your street frontage for harmonious development and things, so that still y'all calculated it along the road and back out. So this would not fall under the infill standards of the okay. subdivision regulations. Okay. Um, those apply to lots that are along existing streets. Gotcha. This is a new street, and also they do not apply to cluster lot subdivisions in okay. this manner. Um, there are standards for the cluster lot subdivisions in regards to lot um, size and how much they can cluster down. Down depending on if there is a buffer provided or if it is along an existing street, there are different standards for cluster lots. All of these front onto the new street. However, in an effort to increase the um, harmony of the subdivision, the developer has created two larger lots that are closest to Curry Road in an effort to um, exceed the requirements of the subdivision regulations and the cluster lot, but to make it um, uh, harmonious to the to the uh, neighborhood. So they're actually exceeding what would be required for those front two lots. And I'm not sure if we can do this um, next question, um, but this is similar to uh, a case that was in my district and there was a lot of discussion about, so like the, the front two lots that are bigger, which way are those houses gonna face? Is that something that it can be regulated by the, I mean, I, I, I am blown away that there's no community here because this was extremely dramatic and lots of fireworks, not just when it was at council, but over the summer, so. Um. Uh, those, I believe, are both oriented to the new road. Okay. But the develop, the applicant may be able to, sure, to, to, to wants provide, to but up. I believe they're both oriented to the new road. Yeah, no, I think I think that I'd like to just get that kind of on the record. So with the community, if they want to review or whatever, we'll know kind of what's coming. Yeah, so I'll, can you run us through that? Well, I want you to know first that, you know, we have community meetings and we, and, and most of you guys know that. And in this case, there were a lot of meetings. And uh, the most recent meeting was either a week or two ago. The council member was there. There was probably 10 people there. Uh, and so it's, it's fully been discussed with the community. And, and when I lay a plan out, I try to take all that in consideration. So although I wasn't required to, I made those lots bigger on the front and I put them so they could be set back enough so they could actually face Curry Road and sort of mass okay. the matching, the, the massing of the houses on Curry Road. So that was the intent. Even the road that comes in there was sort of put at a little bit of an angle so the road would come out between two houses because there was a neighbor across the street. It's like, you know, I don't want somebody coming right out my front door. And so th there are a lot of things that go into these plans, even the open space on the plan on that north side, it's gonna preserve a lot of vegetation, a lot of trees, and so I, I think this is a pretty good plan. It is reduction of density. The plan that was reviewed before, barely eked by this commission. It was, a lot, a lot of people in the community didn't like it. And so I think that this is gonna work out the best in the end, I hope I answered your question. That covers Thanks. me, thanks. Would anyone else like to speak before we go for a motion? Can I just ask a question? Yeah. Um, Make sure I understand, and this is my learning from you, but 
What's the difference between cluster zoning and cluster homes? Um, there is not, we don't use either of that. We probably use those terms interchangeably. What it actually is is a cluster lot option in the zoning code. So it is within the zoning code. It's a buy right development pattern. It essentially says that within residential zoning districts, you are allowed to cluster lots onto smaller, you're allowed to cluster homes onto smaller lots. It doesn't give you any sort of increase in density. So if your lot is one acre and you're zoned, R10, RS10, that would essentially give you four lots. With a cluster lot, you don't get any more lots. You're just able to reconfigure those lots maybe to be smaller and provide open space. And so it's not at an increased intensity. Okay. And so it is a cluster lot provision that is permitted by right by the zoning code. And my understanding is that in exchange for that density or smaller lots, that they actually are that the landowner and the community decide what kind of open space is needed? Uh, no, there are standards in the zoning code and it indicates that you have to have 15% open space. There are standards that require recreational facilities if you get over a certain number of lots. This does not meet that threshold. And so it's not a, um, it's not a uh, kind of input, it is a requirement that you have 15%. Staff looks at it to make sure that it is in um, appropriate areas or that it's accessible um, if there is a required recreation area. And so again, it's not an increase in density, right. it's the same density that the, that the zoning currently permits. Yeah, I understand that it's kind of a conservation-oriented kind of development, but I just wanna make sure that we do have some conservation development here, so. All right, any other comments from commissioners? Discussion? Would someone like to make a motion? To move things along, I'll, uh, <laughs> I, I, I agree with the staff's recommendation. I make that, that this complies with the zoning. So is that a motion to approve? <laughs> that's a move to, that's a motion to approve. So I didn't move it along as fast as I would. <laughs> any seconds? Second. Okay, great. Um, all in favor of the motion to approve staff's recommendation? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so that ha motion has passed. So now we will take a short break and we'll reconvene very quickly. If you're on your way out, go ahead and leave. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> sorry, it's the pregnancy. <laughs> All right, so. As a preliminary question, um, is anyone here to speak on 22A or 22B? Okay. Just, Just the applicant, okay. Anyone here to speak in opposition? It looks like um, anyone who may have pulled that item or those items off of consent have left. So typically in those instances, if we had something on consent and the folks in opposition um, left, presumably because they are no longer in opposition, we would just put those items back on consent. So for commissioners, um, do we have a motion to put those items? Okay, great. Um, all in favor, putting 22A and 22B back on consent, say aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, great. So those two items for now include as part of the consent agenda. So we will go ahead and get started with item number 20. That one. Okay, 
Item 20 is a proposed subdivision on Gale Lane. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. Um, item 20 is a proposed subdivision on Gale Lane. The request is to subdivide the existing lot to create two lots. Staff's recommendation is to disapprove unless the Planning Commission finds the subdivision can provide for the harmonious development of the community. Uh, the approximately one acre site is located on the south side of Gale Lane. Um, it's highlighted in the light gray here. Um, it is zoned R10, residential one and two family. Um, if subdivided to create two lots, a maximum of four units would be permitted total. So one to two on each lot. And the surrounding properties are zoned similarly R10 and have been established with one and two family uses. Um, the policy for the site is T4 Urban Neighborhood Maintenance. And as um, you know, the policy for the site helps guide um, our subdivision uh, processes. Um, here is the proposed plat. The site is essentially being divided in half with a new proposed lot line. There is an existing single family structure on the site which would be demolished um, if the subdivision were approved. Under the maintenance policy, the subdivision is required to meet the requirements of chapter three of the subdivision regulations, including compatibility standards. Um, there are also other subdivision standards, such as uh, meeting the base minimum of the zoning code lot size, um, which the both lots do. Um, both lots have frontage along a, an existing public street. And next we will go into the lot compatibility analysis um, of maintenance policy properties. Um, looking at the proposed lot frontages based on the surrounding lot frontages, um, the proposed frontage for each lot is 52.21. Um, what would be required per the compatibility standards would be 53.62 feet. Looking at the lot area, um, the minimum size to meet compatibility is 0 0.43 acres and each site is zero, each lot is 0 0.46 acres. Um, any future development on the site would be required to meet the setbacks of Metro zoning code. Um, all lots are oriented to Gale Lane consistent with the surrounding parcels and all other Metro agencies have recommended approval of the application. Section 3-5.2F states that if a proposed subdivision meets the required standards, except for the compatibility requirement, the Planning Commission may consider whether the subdivision can provide for the harmonious development of the community. Um, they, the subdivision regulations outline several different items to look at, including the development pattern of the surrounding area, um, any unique features on the site, as well as um, the ability to place reasonable conditions on the development of the subdivision. So looking first at the development pattern, um, the site is uh, starred and the, um, all the properties along Gale Lane are located within the same neighborhood maintenance policy area, um, therefore subject to the same compatibility requirements. Of the 18 lots on the south side of Gale Lane, um, highlighted in this yellow color, um, seven of the 18 properties have a frontage of less than 53 feet, which was the required minimum for the proposal. Of the 16 properties on the north side of Gale, highlighted by the blue dashed line, no lots have a frontage of less than 65 feet. The lots along the north side have less depth than the lots along the south side, which allow them to put more up front rather than distributing it lengthwise, um, something to look at in how the lots are laid out. Um, the zoning 
as I mentioned before, is one in two family residential, which permits um, one in two family units. Um, and as you can see from the aerial, many uh, lots within this block have recently redeveloped. Um, staff found no relevant geographic, topographic, or environmental features on the site that would impact this subdivision. <coughs> Lastly, um, to ensure the harmonious development, um, Planning Commission may impose certain conditions on the development. Um, the applicant has actually uh, proposed several standards um, that would be added to the plat that would um, guide any future development on the site. Um, this includes limiting the height to two stories within 35 feet, um, as well as orienting the units to have one, if two units were established on the lot, one would be at the building setback and one would be located behind, um, in addition to shared access between the lots. Um, as the subdivision does not meet compatibility standards, staff recommends disapproval unless the Planning Commission finds that the subdivision can provide for the harmonious development of the community. Thank you. So we will open this item up for public hearing. Is the applicant here? All right. So you have 10 minutes, and you can save two for rebuttal. Before I get started, I, I did submit two, two exhibits that I'd like to share with the commission. Um, unfortunately, I only made four printouts, uh, but uh, so I hope you don't mind sharing. And I'll touch on those two exhibits in my presentation. Um, so Dwayne Cuthbertson, 1806 Allison Place, I am before you representing the owner of 909 Gale Lane, Patty Turner. And as the staff uh, suggested to you, we're proposing to subdivide this very large property into two residential lots. This property is located at the back side of the 12 South neighborhood. As most of you know, the 12 South neighborhood is a, is a relatively diverse urban neighborhood in the core of our city. It contains a variety of housing types, from single families to duplexes to quadplexes to multifamily uh, in this neighborhood. Um, this neighborhood is, is bordered by some very intense commercial corridors on 8th and 12th. It's a, it's a destination for folks, and it's becoming very unaffordable. Um, the, the neighborhood also contains a, a wide variety of residential lots, uh, but I'd submit to you that the great majority of the lots in this neighborhood, if, if, we can, um, if we can zoom out to the greater neighborhood, the majority of these lots in the neighborhood are about 50 by 150 or 7,500 square foot lots. And then one of the exhibits that I put in front of you uh, has an expanded view of the neighborhood and it shows that there are a lot of lots that contain less and significantly less than what we're proposing with this subdivision. Uh, 909 Gale has the misfortune of being in that one pocket in this neighborhood that contains very large lots. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, the subdivision regulations ask staff and ask the Planning Commission to, to constrain their view to a very limited area, five, five lots on either side of this block. Uh, fortunately, the subdivision regulations also give this commission the ability to take in the larger context, and that's somewhat the basis of our argument today, is that the lots that we're proposing at a half an acre each, or just under a half an acre, are significantly larger than most that you'll find in this neighborhood. Um, so again, we're proposing half acre lots much, much greater than uh, what you'll find. The first exhibit that I gave to you, again, has that expanded view, and you'll see some uh, shaded areas. All of the properties that are shaded in yellow contain a lot area that is less than what we're proposing. And as you'll see in that exhibit, that's a big, that's a lot of property in the surrounding area that uh, contain a lot, uh, that are smaller than what we're proposing. Uh, as you go north in this neighborhood, the lots get smaller. Um, so where we're slightly off is in the lot width, as uh, uh, staff pr provided to you. We're proposing two lots at 52.2 feet in width. We're talking about 17 inches. We're off by 17 inches per lot. I'd submit to you that that is a pretty imperceptible difference uh, when experienced along Gale Lane at 35 miles an hour. Um, and as Gale Lane has begun to redevelop, what we're proposing with that lot width is, is fairly consistent um, 
with the pattern. So um, I'd also want to point out exhibit number two uh, in front of you. That's the subdivision for this area. And you'll see on there, I've, I've identified 909 Gale uh, with the star. That's the property we're proposing to subdivide. It's the largest lot in this little cluster. But I want to point out 913 Gale Lane. It's two lots to the west of, of our subject property. And you'll notice some dashed lines that go down that property. Those are units. And so that property is, has four underlying lots. That's how those 50-foot lots to the east were created, where you've got that really intense cluster of house behind a house. That's the instrument that those properties use to redevelop. So 913 Gale has four underlying lots. And so I'd submit to you, not if that property develops, but when that property redevelops, you're going to have two 43-foot lots with a house behind a house. And if that were to be there today, if we were able to use underlying lots, we wouldn't be in front of you. Those two lots would kick us into compatibility. Staff would be able to approve this administratively. So uh, as staff also suggested, we've proposed a number of conditions on this plat. She pointed out uh, the two stories and 35 feet. Um, uh, also proposed the shared driveway will only have one point of access uh, as opposed to, to the two that would come with a traditional uh, redevelopment of this lot as it is. Um, we're also providing architectural standards. We're, we're limiting uh, materials so that you get quality materials, but we're also committing to tree preservation. There are a lot of mature trees in the front yards of this property, so the character is important to the owner, and she is committed to preserving all of the mature trees in, the, in that setback uh, that would be required by the code. So um, I'd submit to you that those conditions that we're proposing will ensure that the results of this subdivision would be harmonious with the character that's emerging on Gale, but the character, character that largely exists in the, the greater 12 South neighborhood. Uh, in fact, I think uh, it would enhance that character. Um, and the way we're laying out this subdivision, as you experience this property, uh, as you move along Gale, the pattern's not going to change. You're going to have a house, a gap, and then a house. That's what most people will experience uh, when they look at the property or when they drive by this property. There will be two houses behind the houses up at the street setback, and I won't, I'm not gonna sit here and say that you won't see those. You'll see them, but they certainly, with the preservation of the trees and the architectural standards, building height standards, they won't be, uh, they won't have a perceptible presence on Gale Lane. I don't feel like what we're proposing is a slippery slope. It doesn't open up uh, additional subdivisions of adjacent lots. Um, it's, it's not something that, well, if you approve this here, well, the whole of the neighborhood's gonna start dominoing down. Um, again, the greater neighborhood is, is consist, it consists of very small lots, lots that are significantly smaller than what we're proposing with these two. Um, So uh, again, I, I just leave you with the idea that we're off by 17 inches, 17 inches. And per lot, I really feel like that's not a perceptible difference. Um, what we're proposing is harmonious with the character of the neighborhood. The conditions that we are adding to the subdivision reinforce the character that we feel will enhance the neighborhood. And with that, I'll stand for questions. Thank you. Is there anyone else here wishing to speak in support? So if you could give your name and address and you each have two minutes. Are, are you in support or in opposition? Support. Support, okay. It's my property. <laughs> I'm Patty Turner and I live at 909 Gail Lane. I have lived there since 1973, and I've seen all the changes that have occurred in and around our neighborhood. I would never do anything that would interrupt the harmony that exists on Gale Lane and Clayton and several of the other streets that I'm familiar with, where I have a lot of neighbors and friends. But I am of the age 
I won't go into that. However, time has come for me to downsize. I've raised my children there. Um, everything has been wonderful. And all the new additions to the street have been some wonderful people. I don't foresee, for example, three more houses becoming a burden to anybody. Um, one neighbor that would have come, she was unable because she has to take care of her husband. Another longtime um, resident of Gail Lane. But when I talked with her, she thought I was talking about a subdivision. <laughs> I said, no, I'm talking about two lots. And I realized that my lots would be larger than any other lot on that street, the individual lots. So I just didn't think 17 inches would create such havoc. So I'm just asking you to support my endeavor so that I can move on to the next phase of my life. That sounds a little morbid, but, <laughs> but that's what I'm asking for. And I please hope you will consider my request. I'm gone. Thank you. Hi, I'm Betty Treherne Harris. I um, am a real estate agent. I'm the agent who represents um, Mrs. Turner. I am also um, a resident of the neighborhood. My husband and I live at 819 Clayton Avenue. Um, we, it's within walking distance. I just go to around the corner and I get to see Patty. Um, I have been there since 1967. So um, when she moved in, in 1973, we have been neighbors, you know, since that time. But what I want to do is to describe m where my house is. My house, Clayton Avenue, runs parallel to Gail Lane. And from my backyard, I look in the back and I have 4,400 hundredths of an acre. I, my, I, my lot is not as big as hers. But when I look out my backyard, I see new housing. And the new housing um, goes, my neighbor Stovalls, and they were here, um, the son was here and had to leave. But the Stovalls and the, and the um, um, Larissa's house and the very next house, all of these new houses are there backing up at the very back of my backyard. When Patty walks out of her front door, She's looking at the same houses that I'm looking at from the opposite direction. So what we're proposing for this property, the subdivision of this property, is certainly consistent, you know, with the neighborhood. In fact, across the street from Patty, there is one original house, a little site-built house. And I don't know why it's still there, but it is. But everything else, is a horizontal regime attached or detached. So um, I am asking for your approval. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone else here to speak in support? Yes. Okay. My name is Diane Lee Smith and I live at 917 Gale Lane. Um, in relation to this property, I'm four doors down toward 12th Avenue or Granny White. I've only lived in that neighborhood eight years, and we bought the home from the original owner back, my boyfriend bought it from the original owner in the 90s, and then I moved in eight years ago. In those eight years, on the 900 block of Gale Lane, I've seen five houses built from what had previously been one, a one-home lot. I've seen four homes built on a lot directly across from me that was originally a one-house lot. Further down toward 8th Avenue Franklin Road, there are two side-by-side -side lots that have four homes on them where they had previously been one house lots. And then just across from uh, the section between where Patty lives and I live, there are two uh, homes that are built on what was previously one lot. So the neighborhood has changed. There is diversity. 
So the harmony, if you're speaking about housing style or housing consistency is not there. If the harmony has to do with support of the neighborhood uh, about this proposed zoning revision, then I will have to say Patty did her due diligence. She walked the neighborhood, she walked to all of the neighbors around her and spoke to them individually and secured signatures in support of her motion. I know there are people that don't support it that live nearby, but there are a number of us who are here who do. So is it, is it the luck of the draw that she just happens to be further down in the queue and asking for a revision of her property in order to accommodate what's already existing on our street. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak in support? If not, is there anyone wishing to speak in opposition? You could give your name and address and you each have two minutes. My name is Anna Webb. My husband and I live at 905 Gale Lane, which is just two doors down from this property. Um, we uh, have watched the, the uh, nature of the neighborhood change somewhat, but I submit to you that perhaps as short-term rentals got away from us, basically it's changing because we're letting this home behind a home get away from us. If you have that, draw, that uh, slide that was shown initially about the lots uh, where the star was located, two, st two properties down on that side, they did exactly what's being proposed now. And where I used to step out with morning coffee and see the sunrise, I see a wall of home. Two homes, one immediately behind the other, very little space between, and I think they thought they were building a two-story house, at least what we were told, but the entrance door starts a half a story up. These are massive, massive wall of home is now what I see. So here I'm gonna be in the fishbowl with the same thing happening two doors down, and I won't get a sunset. And I'm an artist. Light is important to me. And the, the home I invested in, my very first home, I expect it to be my last home, um, it's kind of being yanked from me. And I would like to think that we don't put a different ruler to what we were talking about, home occupation, where we are not letting people earn money from their home, um, but we're gonna vote in favor of people earning money from their home as they leave and leave their neighbors behind. So I hope you vote against it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm LB Gators. I live at 907 Gale Lane. And I hope I don't get too emotional because this is very difficult. My neighbor of more than 47 years, uh, 46, 47, we're now pitted against each other. We talked about never leaving Gail Lane, but she finds it necessary to do so. Our kids grew up when Gail Lane was a street that was less traveled so that our kids could stay in the street and play. We'd say, car coming, car coming, and they'd run back in. I've seen neighbors die or move away because they couldn't pay their property taxes. Then Nashville started growing, and I have no problem with Nashville growing but I have to consider the impact of four or even two, two-story houses right next door to me. I may not have been the best neighbor all these years, but I mean no harm to my neighbor. I'm only hoping to preserve what's left of what was once a livable, a beautiful neighborhood. I was asked to sign a form and I did not. I was not okay with the building. And 17 inches, I don't know how that makes a difference in what I have to live next door to. If it was just another beautiful home like Patty lives in now, I would have no problem with it. 
but it's not going to be that way. Consider if you had to live next door to what is being described. It's not easy. Please look into it and help both of us to live comfortably for the rest of our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? If not, applicant, you have two minutes for rebuttal. I was listening to the opposition and I can certainly appreciate their concerns. Um, you, you all hear those concerns all over Davidson County as, as our region uh, rapidly changes. Um, with that said, we, we have received a fair bit of support from the 12 South neighborhood and the surrounding community. Um, and as you all probably know, 12 South is a pretty active neighborhood when it comes to land use matters. And if there was this sentiment of uh, a lack of support, you'd see a lot more folks here. You'd see the council member here. So um, we have actually received a lot of support for what we're asking for. Um, 12 South is an urban neighborhood. It, it has changed, for better or for worse. Uh, it's, a, it's a central neighborhood that has a lot of infrastructure. It can accommodate the growth. It's, it's actually where we, as a region, need the growth to happen. Um, I'd submit to you still that, uh, in terms of the subdivision, that 17 inches is pretty imperceptible as you might experience the character of this neighborhood. But more so, the conditions that we're proposing uh, I feel like will result in a much better outcome for this neighborhood, the neighborhood's character, as well as the immediate neighbors. It does restrict the building height to a maximum of 35 feet. It does preserve the trees, and trees are pretty important to a neighborhood's character. Uh, without the conditions on this subdivision, you're relying on the zoning code, and maybe it's three stories and 45 feet, the houses. Uh, maybe the trees are there, maybe they're gone, but I feel like the conditions we're proposing help preserve that character. Um, short-term rentals, when you do an HPR, short-term rentals really aren't practical. You have to own both of the houses on those properties, and you have to live in the one to short-term out the other. Um, so I don't feel like short-term rentals are going to be in play with this subdivision. Um, so uh, I just submit to you that what we're proposing is harmonious. Thank you. <clears throat> so I will go ahead and declare this public hearing closed. Um, Commissioner Moore, do you want to kick off the conversation? Or maybe I don't. Um, <laughs> so I guess my first question is, um, so we can subdivide the lots into two, two separate lots, but each of those lots can have two houses, one behind the other, correct? So um, if built, those the front house would be subject to the like setbacks of the rest of the neighborhood. Does that question make sense? Yeah, okay. setbacks would be per the zoning code, um, and it generally requires a contextual setback based on where the existing homes are on either side, um, up to a maximum of um, three times the required, which I think is 20 feet. So. Oh, it's a major street, so it might be more than that. So it's a collector, um, but it would be based on codes, but it would be generally consistent with where the existing houses are on the street. Um, and then when considering harmonious development, so we can look at the pattern of houses around there. And so when we consider that, we can only consider those 17 lots, or can we look at the larger area? That's up to you all. Um, we presented you with some base information to kind of start your consideration, but it's really up to you. Um, Amelia, if you can go back to the slide that, that gives the, the F section. There. Um, so essentially the subdivision regulation for infill subdivisions, which is subdivisions created on existing streets within maintenance areas that are previously subdivided and predominantly developed, it outlines for you that um, it has to meet certain um, compatibility criteria. And that criteria is based on um, looking at only the five lots on either side of the proposed subdivision, so it is limited. Um, and so essentially, the subdivision regulations give you all, as the commissioners, some leeway um, to look beyond just those five lots. Um, 
if the subdivision meets all other standards. Uh, in this case, it does meet all other standards, and so compatibility is the one thing that is missing. It's uh, 1.4 feet short on either lot. Um, and so it outlines for you that you can look at the de development pattern of the area. We gave you some information on the very immediate just to start the conversation. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I guess I'm struggling because um, with it meeting everything else and I think of 1.4 feet as the, on the scale of things as a, a small small space um, and thinking about the rest of the lots, starting with the 17, so um, seven of those have uh, the frontage less than the 53 point, whatever it was, feet. Um, I don't know, I guess I want to hear from other people because I am still struggling on this one. Um, well, I, I think this is kind of a special area of Gales Lane. I like that area. Uh, normally, if it were 17 inches, I would kind of say we could work with it, but I'm tending to support the staff's recommendation of disapproval. Commissioner Sims. I want to make sure that this does fall under the subdivision regulations. Is that, are we making it out of that criteria for sure? Is that This is a subdivision. It's not a rezoning. No, just a subdivision. Any variance, um, subjective variance from the commission has ended up being in court. And so this is, a, in my opinion, a very significant variance. I went and walked this neighborhood, drove past it, and it's not compatible, so. Commissioner Tibbs. Um, well, I guess, well, let me ask you a question. Is it really three houses that are going on these two lots, or is it two houses going on these two lots? Uh, this is a subdivision to, it's one property now. It would create two lots. Each of those two lots could have a duplex. And so it could be uh, four total units between two new lots. The one current lot right now permits a duplex. Um, and could you go back to the slide that has the um, context a little bit more? So, um, so yeah, I, I'm pretty familiar with this as well. And I, I, all the others that are two, I guess that was why I was um, originally feeling like it was pretty contextual. I will say that this right in the middle does start maybe um, change, but just you know a couple down, <clears throat> it's. Um, there are two lots, it seems like, uh, are pretty, you know, similar to what's already being approved there. Um, but uh, I think you said three or six, <laughs> then it does kind of get out of it. And then, um, and then they're all using one driveway, then it does get a little bit. So um, I guess the way I'm understanding it, then I would have to uh, also agree that it's, it, I don't feel like it's harmonious if you can get to that much density there. And Am I misunderstanding? No, 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 you could only, the maximum that would be on this piece of property would be four units. Okay. Total, that's okay, it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, that's where I was originally thinking. Okay, well then, I think four, it does kind of match with uh, what else is on, what's been going on like across the street, which is directly across, well, maybe not directly across the street, but, um, but yeah, even some across the street too. Um, yeah, I do understand how this um, neighborhood has changed a lot um, just in the time that I've been here, but I, I do feel like this is kind of the pattern that's been happening um, already. So it actually probably does kind of match the development that's going. So I would, uh, I guess I do feel like it is contextual. Council Lady Murphy. Thank you. Um, so the idea that 17 inches per lot should just be thrown out um, and not considered, I think is is just so far out there. Um, I understand where you're coming from. I I am someone who gets paid to to try to convince people of my ideas as well. Um, but so if you add that up, um, you're, you're talking about 34 inches because it's 17 per lot short. Is that correct, Lisa? 17 inches short per lot? It's 1.4 feet per lot. Okay, and the side setbacks in R10 is five on each side, correct? 
So we're talking Correct. about when we're looking at 1.4 per per lot short, um, we're looking at a half a setback essentially. Um, and so I think that when you look at it that way, that you're you're making it closer together by half a setback. If we allowed this, um, I think we're almost getting to where you know if this was a different zoning, if it wasn't R10, if it was R8, then you know it might be a different situation. But it's not. It's R10, um, and at this current time of calculation of the lot compatibility and frontage, it doesn't meet the standard. Um, and so it's not harmonious, and I don't think that we can support it. So. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Um, so looking at the analysis, uh, seven of uh, 18, the other side is 53.62 uh, feet. However, the uh, northern side, uh, I don't know, I might be directional is a challenge, but uh, the, the other side where the subject property is, no lot have frontage uh, less than 65 feet. So if we allow this subdivision, so this lot will be only exception. Am I reading right? No, the, this lot is on the south side of Gale Lane. So okay. this is on the side where there are seven lots uh, with, so, with okay. less frontage than what is being proposed for these lots. So blue side has no lot less than 60. That, that's it. right. The blue the blue lot was uh, doesn't have any less than 53.62. Um, they're just... The north, south, and the north side and the south side are configured a bit differently in the depth, mm -hmm. um, but we wanted to just give you the the information for this kind of block. Okay, uh, so would you could you talk me about the underlying lot? When I t uh, look at the parcel viewer, I did not see any underlying plot existing uh, this uh, on the Gale Lane. So I would like to confirm, indeed, uh, the applicant information is correct on that underlying plot on. I believe some of the existing lots that were created towards the east end were, those were created because they were underlying lots. And so there were some underlying lots, but they've already been reestablished. And so you wouldn't see them the same way on parcel viewer now because they've been reestablished. So could you confirm 913 Gale Lane? Because information per applicant is 913 Gale Lane has existing underlying plot. That's so, that's just weird. so if, you'll, you'll, I'll have to look it up. I can't answer that. Okay. I, don't, I don't have the um, parcel viewer in front of me, so I have to okay. go. So, I'm sympathetic with the applicant. It's like it's only you know one foot and four inches. However, I think uh, this is a neighborhood maintenance. So maintaining neighborhood is very very important. So if we were to allow, yeah, just because only one foot four inches. So let's ignore uh, the or give away the one foot four inches, and we are. Uh, not abiding by our standard. So for that reason, I am in support of the staff recommendation to disapprove this subdivision. All right, so we need a motion. Does anyone want to make a motion? Uh, move to, do we move to disapprove here? What? It's a little different than council. I move to support the staff recommendation to disapprove to the disapprove. subdivision. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's what I move. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Second. Okay. So um, all in favor of the motion to disapprove, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have one in opposition. Okay. So the ayes have it, and this item has been disapproved. So we will move on to item 21.
Let me know when you guys are ready. We are ready if you like to go. Okay, item 21 is a request for a concept plan approval for a cluster lot. This is the project that uh, Councilman and Reese was talking about earlier. Site is highlighted in, or outlined in red. It's approximately 23 acres. This is on the north side of East Campbell Road. Gallatin Road is uh, to the edge of the screen on the right. Uh, east of the site and I-65 is to the west. The plan is to create 44 single family lots. Staff is recommending approval with conditions. The current, or the, the zoning is single family residential RS20. Uh, requires a 20,000 square foot lot. Under RS20, we could get a maximum of 51 single family lots. This is a subdivision process. This is the first step. The next step would be final site plan approval and final plat, which creates the lots. This is a cluster lot option as um, presented previously. It's intended to provide flexibility of design, the creation of open space, and the preservation of natural features. These standards are achieved by allowing lots to be reduced in size from the minimum lot size that the underlying base zoning district would require. Um, under the cluster lot option, uh, the maximum number of single family lots permitted would be 44, with a minimum lot size of 10,000 square feet, and it would require it a little over three acres of open space. This is a proposed concept plan. It's got 44 single family lots that has a density of approximately two dwelling units per acre. Lots range in size from 10,000 square feet to 18,000 square feet. Access for the new lots will be all on new streets um, that will have access off Highland Circle and East Campbell Road. There are also lots on Ronnie Road, which includes an extension of where it dead ends um, on the south side of the property. It will run all the way to East Campbell Road. The plan provides um, sidewalks along all streets as, as well as on Highland Circle and East Camel Road. Open space provided is approximately 8.8 .8 acres. Um, includes active areas. There's also a mail kiosk and includes buffer yards which are located along the perimeter adjacent to the lots. Again, um, under the cluster lot option, the proposed plan is consistent. It's within the maximum number of units, within the maximum number of open space, and is um, over what is required for open space. Inclusion staff is recommending approval as request does meet zoning and subdivision regulations. Thank you. We will open this item up for public hearing. Um, I know we have the council lady here. Um, we would typically invite you to go last if you would like to do that, council lady. Yes, I'll speak at the end. Okay, great. So if the applicant is here, um, you have 10 minutes and you can save two minutes for rebuttal. Good evening, my name is Brian Dunn. I'm a land planner and landscape architect with CSDG 2305 Klein Avenue here speaking tonight on behalf of the applicant. Very excited about this project. It has a lot of positive elements to it. Uh, myself and also Kyle Griffin, the civil engineer on the project is available for any and all questions that the commission might have. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, so if anyone is here to speak in support, if you could come forward. And let's say we're gonna hold two minutes for a bottle. Denita's first. Are, are you holding two minutes for a bottle? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, um, so if there's no one here to speak in support, is there anyone here to speak in opposition to this item? Okay, if you could line up and give your name and your address. All right, um, my name is Matt Gaylord and my address is 925 North Graycroft Avenue. Um, I'm down slope of the proposed area. Oh, uh, and anyway, so my primary concerns are um, local hydrology related. Uh, we've heard some other stuff about stormwater tonight. Uh, we know there's a huge backlog of projects here um, in the Nashville metro area. Um, I've already been made aware by my neighbor here of uh, previous flooding that occurs in flash flood events uh, on my land um, and to my house. And it hasn't fortunately yet happened to me, but I'm worried about stormwater management. I just tonight met the engineers um, and got a chance to talk to them about it some, but haven't really gotten 
very much information at all about what this project would entail or how the stormwater would be managed uh, until just this point. Um, my main, so that's one of my main concerns is, is stormwater management and I certainly wanna make sure that that's adequate. Um, I have friends in the hydrology field. I'd be happy to run uh, some of their plans by and it would be great to have just my own peace of mind. I, I know friends that would do that for me for free and model what the changes would be to our local hydrology. And if I had time to do that, if I could ask for a deferral uh, so that I could get time to do that, I would feel a lot better about this project um, and, and could probably get that done for free. Um, uh, in addition to that, um, there's uh, the size of the lots. RS20 calls for 20,000 uh, square feet, and I heard somebody say 10,000, and that's not correct according to the PDF I pulled up. Also, this company's $234 million publicly traded. They're called, they're on the NYSE, they're called um, American Homes for Rent, and I just found that out tonight. So I don't know if these are gonna be rental properties or if they're gonna be purchased. Um, and so I can't go up against somebody that's $234 million a year. Uh, it, it'd be good to just kind of know what I'm dealing with here. Thank you. If you could also give your name and your address and you have two minutes. Yes, my name's Paul Bush, 927 North Graycroft. I'm his next door neighbor. If I could show y'all some pictures. This is give it 23 staff, years yeah. of problems. The only thing I have against this is the water issues. I've had the issues for 23 years of my house getting watered in it. I've asked Metro to fix this problem and fix this problem. The only thing they're doing now is keep adding to this problem. I'm hoping y'all here could stop this problem for me. I've had a quadruple bypass. I wake up every night. When they say flash flood, I gotta be up every night. And now they wanna put 40 something more houses down my throat. I have a problem with it. That's all I got to say, thank you. Thank you. Um, my name's Spring Houston. I live at 913 Ronnie Road. Um, so this would directly impact me. Um, I live at the dead end that they would be actually trying to extend. Um, traffic out in Madison is increasing already. Um, everybody's trying to cut through neighborhoods now just to get around all the traffic. So I would really not appreciate people coming through my, <laughs> I actually just purchased the house six months ago on you know, the basis of it being the uh, dead end. So um, also, same thing, so the sewage, the you know, water, um, our infrastructure's not quite up to adding more, I guess, that, ma that many more, especially in the area. Our neighborhood is an older neighborhood. I like it. it. They're all the same type of houses. It would be nice if everything was kind of similar. Um, I lived in another neighborhood that had, um, they're all around uh, mid-century modern looking or mid-century houses, one story ranch. Um, and then there's another neighborhood behind it that's completely different and it throws the whole uh, part of Madison off. It doesn't look the same. Um, so I would really appreciate you guys not approving this. I don't want people driving through my <laughs> front yard. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you. If there's anyone else to speak in opposition, um, looks not like not. Okay, so we would like, if you would like to use your two minutes, you can do that, and then the council lady can speak after you. Thank you all again, Brian Dunn with CSDG. This project, as I alluded to earlier, has, has a lot of positive elements to it, but I also failed to mention the, the community support that we have for this project. We have reached out to a number of community members with with mainly the help of the councilman uh, member, Van Reese, about this project. The site's currently entitled for 51 lots. 
and that would require a lot of earthwork, a lot of destruction to the natural habitat for that stream. And so we wanted to look at how do we, number one, return people to nature by allowing some trail network systems through the site, some outdoor recreational elements with maybe a clubhouse and a pool, maybe even preserving that, that existing residence home for a clubhouse and then putting a pool behind it so that community members who may work from home may have an area if they have clients in town to, to go and meet with, with clients. So we, we've been creating all these elements throughout the design process um, but we're very excited about this project and the programming elements that, that it's going to allow not only these residents, but also the surrounding, the surrounding neighbors. Um, we've looked at the community policy, making sure that it adheres to the, to the area, um, and we're very confident that it does. Um, and we are very excited about the community support. We, we understand that there are stormwater issues. Uh, these gentlemen, um, um, we, we have talked at length with them about uh, their concerns. Their properties are approximately 1.5 miles from this property. However, from a stormwater standpoint, we will adhere to not only the local Metro stormwater requirements, but also that of TDEC and the Army Corps of Engineers. So uh, there will be less output of water on this site, ideally, uh, with development versus as it currently stands. So, and, and Kyle uh, Griffin can speak more to that if need be. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, yes, before I, I have some remarks, I'd like to get somebody from Stormwater um, to just address um, what's required in situations like this. Thank you, Council Member Van Rees. Uh, yes, so in general. Um, Can you please state your name? Sure, Kyle Birch with uh, Metro Water. So do you have specific questions or just it, what will be required of this site? Yeah, so um, this site will re be required to have a grading permit. Um, and as part of that process, We'll be looking at things like um, water quantity and water quality. Um, you can see a lot of the green space that they've left set aside on the site. Uh, and I think that's, you know, part of that's leaving as open space, but that space will also be used for um, det detention or bioretention features. Um, some of those details will be flushed out um, as we move along in the process. But, you know, this, this project will be held to all the stormwater management requirements that the, the that Metro has, and um, they'll have to meet those prior to approval. Thank you. Um, <laughs> gadgets. Uh, uh, I wanna thank my neighbors for coming out, for sticking it out. Sometimes uh, it's important to have your two minutes to be heard. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting about, I don't know, 12 days ago, um, that uh, this project has had community meetings for a couple years now. And uh, I uh, apologize to the neighbor on Ronnie Road. Um, I didn't even know she was here and I wanna talk to her. Um, but we have been talking about how Public Works was gonna require um, connectivity on Ronnie Road on this project. This is not something that the uh, developers want to do um, any more than, because uh, it costs money, but it's something that the city's requiring. Um, I am uh, thrilled to have this much green space. Um, I'll, I'll let my previous words speak for themselves, but I wanted to acknowledge that uh, members of the Corsi family are here this evening and have waited as well in order to be able to hear from the community, because from day one, this is what they've wanted to do is to have this land it's never easy to sell the family farm, never. To have this land serve the community. So I wanted to take my time to thank them for waiting and I appreciate your debate over this issue. Thank you. All right, um, so I will declare the public hearing closed um, for our very intelligent and eloquent council. Can you please state the commission's roles when it comes to an item like this? 
Yeah, so this, um, thank you, um, Madam Chairwoman. Um, so, so this is a, a concept plan, and so what the commission is looking at is if it meets the regulations that have been set forth. And if the commission finds that it meets those regulations, um, then you approve the, uh, the plan. Staff has made a recommendation that it does make, uh, meet approval, um, but ultimately the decision is up to the commission members whether to adopt that recommendation or whether to um, disapprove it. Should the commission choose to disapprove it though, however, uh, you should be using material facts um, presented from the record that you've heard tonight and tying that to some specific provision, using those material facts and explaining how you don't feel it meets the regulations that have been set forth. Again, the commission has, I mean, not the commission, the staff has made its recommendation, um, but ultimately the commission is, is, is the final arbiter. Thank you. So, Commissioner Tibbs, would you like to offer your comments? Uh, only that it does seem to comply with um, the subdivision regulations, and um, I, I, I voice my support. Council Lady Murphy. Thank you. Um, so it's this, so it's RS 20 now is the zoning, and they can go down to the 10,000 square feet, um, it says a little over 10,000 square feet to over eight. 15,000 square feet. Is that because it's, um, like we heard before, you can you can bump down zones because it's a it, subdivision? It's not a rezoning, that's right. It's in the, the zoning ordinance permits a cluster lot subdivision, a cluster lot option by right in residential zoning districts. Essentially that means that in exchange for common open space, you're allowed to vary the lots of size, the vary the size of lots. You can go down um, two, two zoning districts from your base. So if you're RS20, RS-15, RS-10, you can go down to um, as a minimum. There are requirements for landscape buffers, and if anything is on an existing street, there are different standards for those sizes. And so you're not getting any additional entitlements. It is simply a uh, different way of, de of developing to provide for um, more um, creativity and open space. So uh, I, it's a little funny to me that the lots don't touch East Campbell Road and Highland Circle? Is that because they might not be able to bump down zones if they were uh, fronting East, East Campbell and Highland Circle? No, they still could. Cluster okay. lots don't require the compatibility requirement that we um, had talked about, so they could still do lesser lots. Um, this is more consistent with um, some of the existing development patterns, and they're creating a buffer between the lots and the roads. Okay, um, and so where it looks like the existing houses is part of that open space up there, um, kind of at the top of the plan, would they ever be able to like subdivide those into additional lots? Um, which lots? So it looks like there's a little house at that, um, like where the big green space is. Um, I don't, I don't know how to describe this. I guess between eleven and. Mm -hmm. So between lot 11 and 10, is that, um, they mentioned that that might become a clubhouse or get developed with a pool or something like that, or would that be where they could come back in later and create more lots and what is open space now? Um, so they're at the maximum number of lots permitted by the cluster lot. So okay. 44 is the maximum number of lots, and so this is the plan of the subdivision. They would not be able to create additional lots. Okay. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. I have no comment or question at this time, thank you. Commissioner Moore. Uh, no comments, it meets um, the subdivision, subdivision, <laughs> ugh, I can't talk, <laughs> subdivision regulations, so I'm gonna support it. I agree with staff's recommendation. Um, I just wanna make sure that we're hearing you well about the water and I don't see that as a condition or don't even know if we really need to list it as a condition, but if we do, that some type of real stormwater study is being conducted, I think would be important to the neighbors. 
It's um, it's the requirement when they, so the, the first level of review at this point by stormwater is to make sure that there is enough land area set aside uh, to handle um, any future stormwater needs when they review the detailed construction plans at the next phase. And so it's an automatic part of the process that with the final site plan, they will do the detailed construction and drainage studies. And that's for the record, so I just want to make sure you know that. Okay, we need a motion. I move approval with conditions. I second it. Okay, so we have a motion to approve with conditions and a second. Um, all in favor of this motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, ayes have it. So this item has been approved with conditions. So we will move on to item number 25. Item number 25 is a request to rezone from Commercial Limited to MULA, uh, zoning for properties at 1009 and 1013 Dickerson Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. The site uh, includes two parcels, comprising a little over half an acre, located on the east side of Dickerson Pike, south of Evanston Avenue. The site is vacant and fronts Dickerson Pike, which is an arterial boulevard. There's also a rear alley which wraps the um, eastern property line um, and, yeah, wraps the eastern property line. Um, Recently completed multifamily development uh, is located directly north of the site on either side of Evanston Avenue. Surrounding land uses along Dickerson Pike include commercial development, um, multifamily, and non-residential development, and then there's lower intensity residential development to the east. The site is located on the eastern edge of the T4 mixed use corridor policy area, um, which extends um, along Dickerson Pike on both sides, running north-south. Um, this policy area prioritizes a mixture of residential and um, non-residential development uh, at a higher intensity uh, because of its prominent location along corridors. The site is also guided by the Dickerson South uh, Corridor Study Supplemental Policy, which is identified um, in this, uh, this outline over here, if I can get the mouse. It's, it's the solid burgundy line um, east of the site. Um, that in the supplemental policy indicates that um, MULA would be appropriate at this location. Um, as mentioned before, Dickerson Pike is an arterial boulevard with um, an existing bus route that runs along Dickerson and several um, bus stops located in proximity to, th to the site. Also, the rear alley allows uh, rear access to the site, which minimi minimizes conflict points along the corridor. The proposed MULA district supports uses that are consistent with the goals of the policy, uh, which is to create vibrant mixed-use areas um, along uh, prominent corridors and at a scale that is appropriate to, tr to transition to the uh, less, intense policy, uh, less intense areas to the east. Um, the alternative district standards will provide building placement and design standards intended to create this urban character um, while again transitioning to the east and enhancing the pedestrian realm. Therefore, staff recommendation is to approve. 
Okay, so we will open up this item for public hearing. Is the applicant here? Okay, great. If you wanna come up and speak, you have 10 minutes and you can save two for rebuttal. Thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners. My name is Waddell Wright. I'm a principal at W. Wright & Company and LP Construction. What we are proposing is a four-story mixed-use building with retail and office on the bottom <coughs> and 21 apartments on top. Uh, this plan, our plan, is designed and uh, fits the uh, East Nashville Community Plan and also the corridor study for Dickerson Road. And we've designed it to exactly what the community said that they wanted out of a mixed-use building in this area. And I am asking for your approval. Okay. Thank you. And you're saving two minutes for rebuttal? Yes, I'm okay. saving two minutes. Okay, great. Um, if there's anyone else here wishing to speak in support, would you please come up? Okay, if there's anyone here wishing to speak in opposition, would you please come up? We've seen you before, but I'll still say it again. You can please give us your name and address and you have two minutes. Yes, uh, my name is Oma Dumini. I still live at 1204 North 2nd Street, Nashville, Tennessee, 37207 for all my fan club members out there. <laughs> um, so we've, we've met with this developer. Um, he came to a CPNA meeting, actually the last meeting, and we spoke with him about this plan. Um, as many of you who may have been involved in the Dickerson Road study also know, I was involved in that. And one thing that I would like to say to uh, a point that the developer made is, is that you know we did agree that we want density along the corridor. And as many of you know, again, uh, one of my big concerns though is to make every effort possible to make whatever, uh, however we can ensure or do our best to ensure that the the, de the density that we're adding is gonna be used for actual residents. That's our primary concern. That was brought up at the CPNA meeting and the developer said, well, I'm not gonna use them for STRs. I said, okay, well, that's great. He said, I'm not an STR guy. You don't need to worry about that. I'm not into Airbnb, blah, 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 over and over. We said, that's great. Okay, so let's work together on this. Why don't we make it into an SP that prohibits STRs? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to be the guy that doesn't get to do it. You know, so I want to have that option. Well, you know what? Again, you can't have your cake and eat it too. He's asking for us to make some concessions uh, in the sense that uh, he's not really going to provide that much parking. How many spots are there? That's a question. Anybody know? Oh, see, it's not important. Direct your comments to the Okay, uh, yeah, we'll does anybody that. know how many parking spots we, are gonna be? We'll get we'll to it. That. All right, well, from what I remember, it's far less than the number of units, and there's a lot of commercial on the first floor. So, you know, there's gonna be spillover into the neighborhood. We're willing to absorb some of these changes to our neighborhood if we are uh, given a little bit of uh, help in making sure that, again, these are used for actual residents. I'm asking you to defer or oppose this until we can work that out. Thank you. Thank you. If there's anyone else here to speak in opposition, would you please come forward? Looks like there's not. So African, you have two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Uh, Wombo and Associates uh, is the civil engineer for this project and the parking requirements conforms to the Davidson County uh, Metro code for parking. Um, not a fan of Airbnb, but I don't wanna give up any rights either just because we are gonna develop a building that is if there's supposed to be Airbnb in the uh, corridor, this is where you want it. You want it on Dickerson Road or Trinity Lane or Gallatin Road, maybe not necessarily in the community, you know, next to houses and, and things like that, but we are on the major corridor and that's a place to put it if someone was able or wanted to put Airbnb uh, in their building. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, I will declare this public hearing closed. Council, well, former council member, Commissioner Johnson, would you like to start off? Sure, thank you. So this is a corridor for the uh, intense development. So as far as uh, usage and land use and development pattern, I think staff recommendation is uh, correct. So. I understand is a neighborhood point of view because we are losing neighborhood by allowing SDR. However, as a uh, planning commissioner, I know our role, we cannot uh, demand no SDR. So since this is a zone change, uh, you know, if as a commissioner, I 
can approve with this change, zone change, as presented. But if there's a will with the community, maybe council member and developer can work it out with further change. So as far as our planning, policy decision, uh, community plan, uh, I have to follow the role to uh, approve staff recommendation. Thank you. Um, Council Lady Johnson, I mean, sorry, Murphy. It's a lot. <laughs> it's of getting late. Ladies it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, that's fine. I am. Did Councilman Parker leave? I know he was here for a while. Okay. Um, I was a little concerned because in his um, his about to say his morning comments, his beginning comments of this evening, he did mention that he wanted to address the Airbnb issue and that we would address it at council. Um, I'm a little concerned because it is a straight rezone. We can't really address that at council. Um, and we've had that issue come up in this area before. And so I'm a little concerned that um, that he might be thinking through something that, that we can't do here. So, um, I don't know if this needs to be. I don't want to speak for him, but I believe he would convert it to an SP. Okay, okay, that's what I wanted. That's good to know because, I, again, since I can't talk to him, uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. So, um, I mean, I think that uh, the councilman has definitely um, shown a lot of responsibility with zoning in this area. But so that does give me some comfort that some conversations have been happening, and so at council when this comes back up. We'll just um, we'll address it in, in committee if it's the will of the commission. Commissioner Tibbs. Um, it seems to uh, conform to policy, and um, it, um, I, I'm in support of it. Commissioner Sims. Um, I had, when I came on board, uh, my mentor, who was on this commission forever, said, "Pearl, remember, rezoning is not a right," and I think the neighborhood has. Um, really ask you for something that should be seriously considered. And um, and I don't, I never did understand if you actually had a community meeting or if it was just a few neighbors meeting with you. It was a few neighbors. I, don't, did, I didn't consider it a full community meeting. If you could come up to the yeah. microphone. Uh, it was about 10, maybe eight to 10 neighbors. I don't think it was a full community meeting. Did you ask for a full community I meeting? I did. I requested a community meeting from the councilman. Okay. But did, but you didn't ask for it through the neighborhood association itself, or no, I mean, you've I got didn't. a very active neighborhood association over there, as yeah, you can right. tell. He, we, I had sent an email to the uh, councilman, and he had emailed okay. back to show up at the community meeting right. at a specific date and time, right. and that's what I did. Well, I really think it's important, given what you're asking here, that's a very small concession they're asking um, for something as big as what you're asking. So I. I really think it, and, we, and they can address it at council. I mean, it, it will, it will, the only time a public has a chance to actually review this is gonna be here. And I think there's probably a better way of going about this for the neighborhood. So I'm, I'm opposed to this. Uh, I agree with staff's recommendation for approval. So I think I also, um, agree with staff's recommendation. I think um, there is some um, room for more conversation. Um, but overall, I think it fits um, the policy. So do we have a motion? This is, this is mine, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I think this is consistent with our policy and I, I move approval. Second. All right, any discussion? Okay, um, all in favor of the motion to approve staff's recommendation of approval, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have one opposed. Okay, so the ayes have it. This item has been approved.
Okay, now we have item number 30. Okay, the next item is a request to rezone from CN to MUNA for property located at 1400 Fatherland Street. Staff recommendation is to approve. The property is located in East Nashville on the southeastern corner of Fatherland and South 14th Street. The zoning is CN Commercial Neighborhood and the surrounding land use is commercial and residential. The policy is Conservation and T4 Urban Neighborhood Center. The goal of the T4 NC area is to maintain, enhance, and create urban neighborhood centers that provide daily needs and services for the surrounding neighbors. Because this property is located on a corner lot along a collector and is within a walkable urban neighborhood, the proposed MUNA zoning supports the goals of the policy to create centers at prominent intersections that will provide services to support residents within a five to 10 minute walk. Therefore, staff recommends approval. All right, uh, is the applicant here? Open public hearing. You have 10 minutes and two minutes for, save two minutes for rebuttal. Very good. Thank you all for hearing us. And uh, please evening. state your name and address. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Richard McCoy. I am with REM3 Studio Architects. Um, thank you all very much for hearing our case this evening. Um, I live at on South 11th Street, which is uh, three blocks from this property. I've lived in within that block area for the last 25 years. I, with the owner, um, Chris Say, who also lives three blocks from this property on Basketball Street, submit an application to rezone this property, 1400 Fatherland from CN to MULA initially. The reason we initially asked for the MULA uh, designation was that I, with another client three months ago, had submitted a very similar uh, application on a piece of property that's actually a little bit smaller than this in acreage and has almost identical adjacent uses next to it. See, um, commercial and residential. Let's see, that, that submittal uh, we, we did without public hearing and similar to the support for this project, we had council planning staff, MDHA, and historics support in that, in that endeavor. <clears throat> it was what made sense for that property and the most, and and for the and for 30 other properties within the East East End, uh, East Nashville, East End and Lachlan Springs that have had the same request in, within the five points design guideline overlay and use policy. Okay. The basis for our application for this for this rezone was that the ability to increase our FAR from 25 percent to something that was more workable and economically feasible from the perspective. Of the current, for perspective on the current FAR, this property would only allow the structure to be around 2,300 square feet total, which for context is three quarters of the size of the single family house that's next door on the residential property. Second reason was to allow multifamily and residential use within the base zoning. The uses between MUN and CN are almost congruent. CN though does not allow for multifamily and residential component. Our third reason for rezoning to MUN or mixed use was to bring the property itself into compliance with the five points, uh, with the MDHA five points design guideline overlay, which has been in place since 1991. That policy has been in place that long and has been revisited numbers, numerous times through community meetings and most recently a uh, overall reassessment was done five years ago 
to revisit all of the land use policies within this. This land policy on this piece of property remained the same as mixed use. So our letters of notice went out. Um, it's not unusual, it was not unusual, and we received from the neighborhood and received some inquiry from those who were made aware of the intent of our property. And this is, a, this is an intentional first step for, public, for the public process. Sorry. Specifically, four residents contacted me or, the, or Councilman Withers out of the 400 letters and postcards that were sent out. I was directly contacted by Mr. Logan Key and Mr. Dale Burkeen. I responded to Mr. Key's questions directly and invited further discussion if he felt it was warranted. I never heard from Mr. Key again. Mr. Burkeen and I had a phone discussion around the same time as my response to Mr. Key and have had one other additional phone call since then. As I stated both of these to both of these individuals, we did not and still do not have specific plans going forward to move on this property. We have ideas about what we want, options and options we'd like to pursue, and those will be vetted out once we know which options are available for this property. I gave them the same reason as I stated above. Our application to change the zoning was to provide more flexibility in the building footprint and the permitted uses. So moving through the process, we came to understand that our, through our councilman and eventually through the planning staff, through discussion, that our eventual recommendation and some of our public rem recommendations have been made for us to revise from MULA to an MUNA, and the planning staff would support that request. After some hard questions and continued discussion with planning regarding the uses that we may lose going from MUL to MUN, like a pediatrician's office or an artisan manufacturing uh, facility, we agreed that the MUNA recommendation. We agreed with the MUNA recommendation. The far differentiation, the, uh, the FAR differentiation, was not going to matter between MUN and MUL to us for this property because the eventual design restrictions. MUN, MUN is the lowest intensity of multi-use zoning in the code. We understand that there have been some scripted concerns sent over to, to the planning commission and to our councilman. I hope the commission has had a chance to read the councilman's responses to each and every one of these concerns. He's done a great job. Um, let's see. First and foremost, we feel like we need to trust the process. We are not required to hold, by any agency, hold any public meetings for a standard zone change such as this. We understand that it's a courtesy. However, I and the councilman made ourselves readily available to discuss these concerns and opportunities after the notice letters were sent out. It only, only a few took us up on it, and as I mentioned earlier, the type of zone changes requested has precedent throughout the neighborhood for over the past 30 years and in over 30 different locations. Second, the process of developing this property will have plenty of public input opportunities. At a minimum, we will have two design overlays that will trigger hearings with MDHA and Historic. It is also our intent, as with as, as was with this same owner a couple years ago to meet with the adjacent neighborhood associations in an organized fashion to inform them of how we would like to proceed and gain feedback. The concern about transparency now when this owner has already has a track record of meeting with the neighborhood is a little befuddling. I even believe the last proposal from this, from this owner was embraced, by the, was embraced by the neighborhood and was eventually denied by the planning staff. Third, to address any development of this building that would occur on this site, our footprint will be restricted by the base setbacks, regulated setbacks from MDHA and historic, landscape buffers and required parking on site. Our height will be restricted not only to the base zoning but to the MDHA five points design guidelines, which is very specific about adjacencies as a single family zone properties as we will be under purview from the historic commission. This project will also require sidewalks. So in closing, um, the zone change is right for this property in this neighborhood because the mixed use designation we are requesting, MUNA, is the lowest intensity of mixed use district in the zoning code. The mixed use designation increases our allowable building area from 25 to 60%. The mixed use designation permits multifamily residential use and property, which is not permitted under the current CN. Our goals for requesting the MUN designation was to moderately increase the buildable floor area add allowable uses that were in keeping with the neighborhood character and good urban infill. The goals of requesting MUN also brings this property into conformance with the 1991 MDHA redevelopment land use plan, a plan that was developed by the community and has been reinforced for over 30 years through many public community reassessments. 
The eventual design outcome will be determined and permitted by the standards already set in place by the historic conserva conservation OLA in conjunction with the MDHA's redevelopment design guidelines, base zoning, and codes, of which there will be plenty of public input, I'm sure. This request has the support of the council person planning staff, MDHA, and historic. The agencies whose involvement in redevelopment in this neighborhood have been continuous from, from th for more than 30 and 40 years. This request to rezone from CN to MUN is identical to over 30 properties within the MDHA redevelopment district land use plan, which have already been rezoned and which was enacted in 91, and as recently as three months ago, all with similar support from our council leadership planning and historic. And that is it. Thank you. Okay, you have a minute and 30 seconds rebuttal. Uh, Councilman Withers, would you like to speak right now or? Okay, uh, is there anyone here that would like to speak in support of it? If you would just come up first. Seeing none, anyone who would like to speak in opposition, please come forward and if there's others, just come line up. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, I do want to thank Mr. McCoy and, and Councilman Withers. We had a nice conversation out in the hallway and uh, uh, I'm not sure we uh, got very far, but we did have a nice conversation. I'm Logan Key and I live at 1411 Fatherland Street, a uh, half block from, from this property. Uh, if you look above the blue uh, box there, I would be the third dwelling on the, uh, to the right. Uh, past the store on the corner there. Uh, I, I was certain, I want to acknowledge that I was certainly pleased that the, that the application was downgraded to a uh, mixed-use neighborhood. Uh, that was certainly something that uh, I thought was a positive direction. Uh, until there's broader community input uh, and a more a defensible consensus amongst the immediate neighbors, uh, it's very difficult to get behind this. Uh, the one common theme uh, amongst the, the folks I've spoken to who were concerned is a lack of awareness. Uh, and, and even, even Mr. McCoy acknowledged that there's no, there's no concrete plan for this property. This is designed to, to open things up uh, to possibilities uh, undefined. I think the best thing that we could do at this point would be to slow this down. Uh, this property is surrounded by numerous homes, but there have been no community meetings. Uh, they have been accessible, and I don't deny that, but, but there does need to be a broader community discussion. We're just ordinary folks trying to have a positive impact on our community, but it feels like it's being presented in such a way that it's that gravity is moving in this direction uh, and that the neighbors ought to just step aside and let the force of gravity do its thing. Uh, there are some topographical considerations, I think, that are worthy of discussion. Uh, we've talked about them some. The, the street narrows by about five feet in the south uh, par on this block, uh, which complicates traffic flow. Uh, the south side of Fatherland has no contiguous sidewalk all the way down, complicates pedestrian flow. And on the north side of Fatherland, where I live, we don't have vehicular access to our alleys uh, because of the ravine back there, so we have to park some vehicles on street. Uh, we can't build carports. Uh, I, I do think we ought to slow down, have a community conversation, and then see where we go. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, commissioners, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. My name is Tony Early. I live at 1506. Fatherland Street. Um, when my wife and I moved into our house in 1997, we shared the block with, with two drug dealers and a house of prostitution. We were also well known for our, our regular free lawnmower giveaways. Um, I myself contributed two lawnmowers, a weed eater, and a table saw to the local economy. Um, when my wife and I adopted our first child in 2005, there was only one other child on the street. Now there are 12 children under the age of nine. The neighborhood has changed in many wonderful ways. My wife and I spent the first two years we lived there wishing we could live anywhere else, but now this is the only place in Nashville we would, we would want to live. Um, I'm, I'm concerned for a number of reasons. One is that it's not a big lot, and a mixed-use development there with parking for the people who would live there, parking for the people who would work there, parking for the people who would be customers there, there's simply not room. That traffic is going to squirt out into the streets around the development, including up my block where all of those children <coughs> live. I um, also don't have a lot of faith in, in the developer because 
several years ago, I, I think it was the same owner, came up with the idea of putting 44 micro apartments on that, on that lot. So I don't think there's a lot of goodwill with the community. I certainly don't think they have our best interest in heart. Um, my wife and I, we've, we've invested a lot in this property, including treasure. Um, we spent a great deal of money on our house and we would like to be able to continue to park in front of it. Thank you. Are there any others? Okay, Rich, would you like to do your, or any rebuttal? Can I, uh, well, oh, please come to the fort. I don't know that there's anything to rebut. I will um, clarify that I believe what Tony was referring to, the project before was not just this property. I think it, it included all the contiguous properties down Father Owen, so. I okay, thank for the rest of my time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilman. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, wanted to, um, uh, I had requested staff, and I know that had it been a little bit more on the ball, I would have probably requested that sooner, but um, in my responses that you will have read, there are lots and lots and lots of um, references to the Five Points Redevelopment District land use plan which those of us in East know a lot about because we have lived with it for so long and have participated in it so long. But I realize that some of you commissioners may not be quite as familiar with that land use plan. And so were, uh, were staff able to print them out and were they in color by any chance? Are they black and white? Okay. So um, there is a land use plan, the Five Points Redevelopment District um, originated with prior MDHA, uh, a five area, five points sub area plan from the 1980s um, that then culminated in the creation of a redevelopment district um, that was created through a very public process with Metro Council uh, in 1991. Uh, that redevelopment district includes some design guidelines, which I'm gonna talk about in a little in a minute, but also included uh, a land use plan. What's really interesting about that land use plan, we know that districts in the state of Tennessee have to be contiguous, and so when you look at that map, you're like, oh, why, why is this district so kind of gerrymandered? The purpose at that time was to create, to sort of control uh, and encourage development uh, on a lot of sort of existing, uh, lots that had existing uh, commercial zoning. So it, did, it kinda does uh, two potential things to base zoning. In some cases, it allows uses, the land use plan allows uses that are not allowed by base zoning. In other cases, the land use plan removes uses that are allowed by base zoning. So there are parcels, for instance, within, within that redevelopment district that have a commercial base zoning, but the community said, we are not comfortable with commercial or mixed use there. So it puts a residential only overlay that removes commercial uses from those parcels in some cases. Um, and so why that is important is because when this redevelopment district was created, that land use uh, map was created, um, there, even today, are properties where, that had commercial base zoning, for instance, <clears throat> where the community had said, look, we're not comfortable with commercial there at all, and we want a residential only use. Um, there have been ample opportunities through that very public process that's been revisited a number of times, that if the community were not comfortable with commercial on this particular parcel, they could have done that process and they have not done that. That land use plan was most recently uh, updated in 2014 and 2015 through a very, again, a very public process um, that all was resubmitted to Metro Council and had Metro Council uh, approval. So, um, like I said, even though it was created in 1991, we, we reviewed it a few times. Um, I would also like to um, go to the uh, redevelopment district design guidelines, and I'm going to read from you just very, very briefly, but it has sub-districts, um, the five points area itself, as you would imagine, it's called the five point sub-district. Sub it's meant to be very intensely uh, commercial mixed use. The, this particular property and the one across the street from it to the north fall in the what's called the commercial corner subdistrict. And the redevelopment district design guidelines, which are publicly available, they're online, and they are incorporated into the Lachlan Springs East End Conservation Zoning Overlay Design Guidelines, says that the corner commercial subdistrict is made up of several non-contiguous nodes. 
within the East Nashville neighborhoods where commercial properties currently exist, and this is one of those. East Nashville has a unique abundance of corner commercial properties that historically have provided neighborhood shops convenient to many residents. These corners can continue to serve the community with a variety of necessary commercial services. Likewise, upper floor residential units can help the viability of these corners and could provide a variety of housing options that are not currently available in East Nashville. The character of these corners should be consistent with the development patterns of the early 20th century. Storefronts along the sidewalk with rear parking will conveniently serve the surrounding residents and enhance the traditional character of the East Nashville neighborhoods. That was the purpose of the commercial corner subdistricts, including this property. And so, again, when you go to what the design guidelines call for in that subdistrict, it calls for specifically not only the land use plan has repeatedly through public processes said we are comfortable with mixed uses on these on this parcel. The design guidelines describe a building that has downstairs commercial with upstairs residential and sort of uh, pull under parking, which is what the applicants are requesting. Um, not only does that sort of meet the, back, back in my day, the, uh, the uh, 2005, 2006 East Nashville Community Plan identified that as a neighborhood center. It certainly meets Nashville Next as the staff have accurately described for what we would want in a neighborhood center. It meets the design guidelines that were created with public input more or less at the same time as the conservation overlay uh, design guidelines were. The same folks, the same community members who were so involved in that historic preservation effort also participated in this process. It was thought to be that um, when you had these sort of commercial corners that had sort of maybe dilapidated or uh, underutilized or, or, or bad uses, that the way to enhance the neighborhood is to take advantage of those opportunities and build sort of a mixed use building that serves the community and provides housing choice um, at these specific locations. So I believe that we've had 30 years of public discussion about what the community expects to go on this parcel. Uh, and that the description in the land use plan that's been reaffirmed, the, the description that is in the design guidelines aligns with a mixed use district. Um, the applicants had uh, initially requested MUL, which is appropriate in some other areas. That was the original request. We actually heard from Mr. Key, provided, who's been very involved, provided some very thoughtful and very detailed analysis, and he wrote back that he thought that MU1 would be better for the neighborhood, and I, I agreed with that. I think staff did as well, and the applicants agreed to that. So I, I believe that, for the most part, we're all uh, based on that, that we're all on the same page with that. Um, in terms of transparency about what would be built here, the applicants um, cannot necessarily design a project until they know what their zoning entitlements are. Uh, so that's why they are wanting to uh, figure that part out and then come back to the community with uh, a little bit more uh, input potentially. Would remind everyone that um, because this is a property that is in a conservation overlay, the whatever building is constructed would uh, have a public hearing before the Metro Historic Zoning Commission, so that uh, provides plenty of opportunities for public input as well as a, as a guarantee. Um, because it is a residential, it is adjacent to residential, there are buffer requirements that would come with MUL, which would provide uh, a buffer requirement against the next door neighbors. I understand their concern. That actually is a requirement of the base zoning code that is being requested. Um, if there were a request to have a variance from that buffer zone, for whatever reason, that would have a Board of Zoning Appeals hearing. So I believe that the base zoning that is requested is um, in line with 30 years of public discussion about what is appropriate for this parcel. Um, I believe that the uh, conservation overlay will allow for community input, input and feedback into the product that is built. Um, and the other thing that I really uh, want to emphasize to folks too is that a lot of the concerns that I've heard actually are about parking, um, and which we hear a lot of in East Nashville. And it is true that that particular portion of Fatherland is, is an unusual street. It lacks sidewalks all the way throughout. The redevelopment of this parcel actually would cause, would trigger the sidewalk requirements in our sidewalk legislation. Uh, that redevelopment to include sidewalks would then actually allow um, 
Public Works to install a crosswalk across 14th, which is badly needed, but there's not really a way to do that presently because of a lack of ADA compliant curbs. That's in the public interest. And something that I've referenced a lot uh, in my responses to uh, constituents is that I actually have a project going on right now, which is uh, the called the East Nashville Neighborways Project, which is working with planning department staff. And sort of what we're doing is we are actually looking at um, treatments for a network of streets that specifically includes Fatherland Street, but also 14th. Uh, we are looking to make Fatherland a uh, neighborhood greenway, which is there are prototypes in other cities. Some of what the uh, that does is it would lower the speed limit all the way to 20, uh, and it seeks public input into what kind of traffic calming applications we would put all along that street to make it safer. Um, we had a we have a stakeholder group in that, which includes representatives from all four neighborhood associations. It includes Includes um, institutional users like Holly Street Daycare, which is just up the street, Lachlan Design School. So we have a lot of stakeholder groups that are also working with their constituencies. And as we've been having community meetings about the East Nashville Neighborways Project, the, some of these commercial corner rezonings have been a part of those discussions. I've actually had six of those community meetings that have included this. It hasn't been the specific topic of the meeting, but have included this in six meetings so far uh, in October and November. And one of the neat things that we do is we take this grid of streets, and just to, to show you, but we take that grid of streets, we give the neighbors different kinds of traffic calming options and kind of what they cost, and we say, what do you think is appropriate? And the neighbors actually get to mark up a map uh, for what they think is appropriate at which place. And then what we're doing is we're aggregating all of those responses to say that out of our project budget, this is how we're gonna spend the dollars based on all those responses. Already I've had about 100 responses uh, to that project so far. What I would really like to do, uh, because this has not yet even come before council, by the way, so you're mainly deciding on policy, but uh, what I uh, would like to do now that we kind of have everyone's attention uh, on this block and everyone agrees that getting this particular block of Fatherland right from the neighborway perspective is key, what I would like to do is I would like to request your approval from a policy standpoint today uh, and then to work with the neighbors and really have a, a focus group uh, for that particular block because it is a little bit unusual uh, and really make sure that I get their feedback to incorporate into the East Nashville neighborways for the traffic calming and pedestrian safety side. And at that time, if it looks like y'all are comfortable with the uh, MUNA, uh, then we can also at least have some certainty that we can provide to those neighbors about what those you know, FARs and uses are so we can incorporate that into that into that discussion, which would happen before this bill would come before council. So I would like to, based on that kind of 30 year history that I've talked about, the conformity with design guidelines that are very publicly available, um, I would like to request your approval of that uh, today uh, and to continue my uh, conversations with neighbors uh, through and immediately after the new year about specifically some of those concerns about pedestrian safety and parking and things like that. Okay, thank you, Councilman. All right, thank you. I declare public hearing closed. Uh, Councilman, oh, not Councilman, Commissioner Gobble. <laughs> um, well, I, I think it meets the policy and I certainly kind of go along with the staff I'm not totally sure what Council Member Weathers was requesting that we could do, or can we do it? Uh, I mean, we either approve or don't, right? I mean, it's like. Well, perhaps if I could just clarify. So the question before us is not a policy change. It's a, it's a, it's a zone change. So the zone change request would go from commercial neighborhood to mixed use neighborhood alternative. Um, the staff has made some recommendations that it meets the policy, but that's certainly to the commission to deliberate. So just to clarify, Councilman, I want to make sure that we're on the same page, that what we're, are you asking us to, to review the zone change? Yes, I just want to make sure. Or are you asking for a deferral of no, this I request? Believe, I believe that this request, which was downgraded at the request of one of the neighbors, which yes. was good feedback, but I'm asking the commission to approve the zone change request as being um, consistent with as policy. Being consistent with good, policy. okay. So does everybody, are you equal? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, I, I agree. I think it's appropriate zoning and, and I also know that the Historic Zoning Commission will look at this thoroughly and there'll be a lot of input in the community at that time, so I'm in favor of it. 
I want to thank you for 30 years of history. And, <laughs> and I do want to compliment you on how well you listen to the neighborhood. I uh, think you, you are just one of the best out there in terms of really being sensitive to that. And I think it does meet the policies. Okay, Councilman. Thank you. Um, I will uh, say that I, I do hear what the neighbor's concerns are. The topography here, as the councilman knows, I've spent a couple of summers over here knocking doors quite often. And and you, like where that vegetation is kind of, um, I, that's where it is a pretty steep drop off. So I think councilman, my advice to, to you moving forward and as this goes through, it sounds like 45 other review processes. Um, I thought Sylvan Park was complicated. Um, you know, I, I think that it's gonna be important for the developers and for you councilman to hold them accountable that the height does not over tower these um, about four properties that you know have no access from from the the street above because it is a very steep drop off and I don't think that you could have a sidewalk along that side of the road. I mean, it's just not. Yeah, it would be really really tough at the top of there. So I guess I think it meets policy, um, but I, I do want to let the neighbors know that I hear them and I know that Councilman Weathers hears you, and I think through the multiple other review processes, just make sure that it is not. Over towering because then that is kind of an abuse of, of the rezone. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. I think it, you know it's it if it's up to every single neighbors, we would like to have everything as a SP, so we will know exactly what we are getting. <laughs> but it's literally impossible. And so I really appreciate you know Councilman Weathers' uh, history about this and community involvement and so forth. And you know, especially East Nashville neighborhood is really, really active and very involved. So as far as policy is concerned, I think makes sense. And it's uh, along with, uh, within a general plan. So I am uh, inclined to support this one. And I am hopeful uh, during with the conversation with uh, Councilman Withers leadership with collaboration with the neighbors uh, after this rezone is approved and going through history commission, MDHA, uh, the final product will be, even though it will be straightforward zone change, you know, uh, building and so forth will uh, appropriate for the neighborhood. Okay, Commissioner Moore, and do you have a motion? Um, I just want to say thank you to the councilman for the history, and um, it's very clear you're very committed to your neighbors, uh, your neighborhood, and all your work is fantastic. So, I move uh, approval. We have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. Okay, now we have item number 31. I've always been told that no one can hear me, so now I'm right up here. Um, item 31 is a request for rezoning. Um, the request is to rezone from residential single family RS10 to residential multifamily uh, RM9. Um, staff's recommendation is to approve. The undeveloped 38 acre site is located on the south side of Old Franklin Road between Cane Ridge Road and I-24. The surrounding properties are a mix of zoning districts and the uses are primarily a mix of large and small lot residential. Uh, the SP to the north, yes, the SP to the north across Old Franklin Road was permitted for a mix of commercial and multifamily uses. The policy for, oh, I'm sorry, one other important piece of information would be that the proposed rezoning um, district would permit a maximum of 343 units on the site. The policy for the site is suburban neighborhood evolving, um, which is intended to uh, provide for a variety of residential uses 
um, in higher densities than um, typical suburban neighborhoods with a variety of different housing types. Um, the proposed RM9 zoning district um, would permit more intensity and a variation in housing style than the surrounding single family zoned properties. Um, in addition, the site can be accessed by two corridors, making it appropriate for increased intensity. Um, with the consistency with policy, staff recommends approval of the rezoning. Okay, would the applicant like to come forward? Please state your name and address, and you have 10 minutes and two minutes for rebuttal. <clears throat> Great, thank you. I will not take that long because um, it's late and I know everybody's tired. Uh, my name is Andrew Steffens, 929 Gale Lane. I'm the managing partner uh, for Wood Partners here in Nashville. Over the past seven years, my team has developed over 1,500 Class A multifamily units in Davidson County. Uh, Wood Partners, uh, the company that I work with, brought me on board to build a local team here to develop Class A apartment communities in desirable locations like this. Uh, Class A is a term that, that means, uh, you know, can mean a, a variety of things uh, to people, uh, but to us, Class A means high-end yet neighborhood-appropriate communities, so communities that fit within the fabric of the neighborhood. Um, we as a company are, are very committed to being and developing neighborhood appropriate, but we realize that we don't get to determine what neighborhood appropriate exactly means when it's a neighborhood that we don't live in. So uh, we always reach out to the community uh, for input uh, in processes like this. So with this particular project, um, we've been working with the District 33 community uh, for over nine months. Um, we've had our first uh, meeting back in March, and uh, since we've had a total of 10 community meetings with Councilwoman Lee, uh, community leaders, and um, community members. Three of the meetings have been very well attended, uh, community meetings with community members uh, having the ability to provide input in the project and express their concerns. Through this nine-month process, we've been able to address and come up with solutions for basically every concern and suggestion that came from the community. Our most recent meeting uh, that was this past Tuesday night, the meeting was very well attended with uh, around 30 community members in attendance and we spent almost two hours discussing the project. Uh, a few examples of the community input that we have agreed to incorporate into the project, um, a cap on density and restrictions on height, confirmation that there will be no short-term rentals uh, in the project, traffic calming measures, and acceleration, deceleration lanes at the entrance to the community, confirmation of exterior materials and design standards, implementing a tree safe program and the protection of stream buffers and wooded areas, leaving uh, over 20 of the 38 acres of undeveloped land for open space, so more than 50% of this property will be open space, and then the development of over three miles of pedestrian access and walking trails to connect the neighboring communities and developments. All of these are examples of community input that we have agreed to incorporate into the development. We realize that there will be more community meetings uh, and more input before we go before council. Uh, in fact, we have a meeting next month that is sponsored by Councilwoman Lee. Um, that will hopefully uh, you know, have a great turnout and we'll hear more, uh, more ideas or concerns. Um, but we, uh, you know, we're intentional developers, we're local, locally based, local team, and uh, I think with this process we've really shown our, our willingness to reach out to the community, hear what they have to say, and try to um, you know, really be uh, malleable to, to whatever concerns they might have and, and just put those to rest. So with that, I would uh, request that we be approved so we can continue on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Tibbs, members of the commission, my name's Sean Henry, 315 Dedrick Street. I'm representing Mr. Steffens and his Wood Partners development. Uh, the way we've looked at this property is really an extension of Century Farms. If you take a look at that uh, aerial photo, 
you'll see that Cain, the new Cane Ridge Parkway uh, comes straight into this, this property. So this property will be developed with a driveway that intersects right where Cane Ridge Parkway intersects with Old Franklin Road. In the north, uh, northwest corner, upper left-hand corner of that photograph, that is Community Health System's new office building. That's a 250,000 square foot office building. There's about 2,000 employees that work in that building. It's a six-story building. Uh, and of course, the entire development there at Century Farms is 300 acres, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of square feet, retail, multifamily, entertainment, and office offices throughout that complex. So uh, directly across, of course, is the property that we're talking about. And the scale of this development that's proposed here on this property uh, serves as a transition between uh, the very heavily concentrated mixed use of Century Farms and the lower lower scale development that you can see in the in the lower right hand corner there that existing subdivision as well as the subdivision that's proposed to the south so uh, this type of land use at the scale that's being proposed fits in that immediate area as a transition and importantly the folks here who need to get on that interstate are going to drive straight across the street through the cane ridge uh, parkway onto the new exit 60 that metro nashville is helping construct uh, and you can drive by interstate, drive down interstate um, 24 right now and see that all of that work that's underway by the developer in concert with Metro's participation. So uh, the idea that there might be some uh, traffic affecting the neighborhood really is not in, in play here. And, and that's why we believe this is truly an extension of the Century Farms development that's underway. So um, we had a, a really good meeting uh, Tuesday night uh, down at the Cane Ridge Community Club. Uh, there's folks here who want to speak about uh, about those conversations and some of the things that bubbled up uh, were concerns about traffic and access and of course uh, i just touched on that point uh, the sidewalk link links that uh, the developer will be installing here um, uh, metro public schools and and issues and concerns about you know um, students and, and potential overcrowding this development will only add an uh, estimated 24 students to the, to the local school system above and beyond what would be there if this property were subdivided into 140 uh, subdivision lots. So negligible effect on, on the school system there. Of course, stormwater control, you can see the ponds that are already on the property that will help uh, with stormwater control, water and sewer extensions, and then parkland. About 50% of this site's actually gonna be left in open space and used as, as both passive and active uh, park uh, with access to the public. Uh, in addition, trails running all through the property. So uh, there was concern at the meeting Tuesday night about infrastructure, public infrastructure. This development is taking advantage of the infrastructure that's already there uh, being built uh, or they're extending it as part of this development. So we ask for your support and approval. Thank you. Hey, okay, thank you. Um, is there anyone here that would like to speak in support of this? If you would, I'll just come up to the front and state your name and address. Thank you. <clears throat> Council, my name is John Taylor. I'm a <clears throat> 3100 Old Franklin Road. My property's on that screen up there. I'm here to talk about my own interest and also the interest of the Curtis Cemetery that's also adjoining this property. Um, my family's been in that area since it was North Carolina, so history is important to me. And out in my area, we have 5,000 apartments coming to our area, 5,000. So one more apartment complex may not be what we need, except the quality and the people that are building it. We hope to use this as an example to the ones coming down the pike, what they need to do to build apartments in our community. So I'm in favor of it. I'm very impressed with Woods. Partners, I, I vote yes, we do this. Thank you. Thank you. Any others would like to speak in support of this? Okay. Uh, there, oh, come forward and state your name and address. Uh, Michael Lampin, 118 16th Avenue South. Uh, I want to thank the council for taking the time to, uh, to hear this, this case this evening. Uh, secondly, I want to thank John Stern, Tawana, and John Taylor. Their commitment to their community is... Uh, it's great to see, it's, it's, it's awesome to see the passion that they have for the people in their community. Um, 
Secondly, the, the, uh, the support and the, the effort that Wood Partners has put into this development, it's impressive to see that they really do truly care about the community. Leaving over 50% open space on a, on a parcel like this in a suburban area, I would say is unheard of in Nashville. Being able to incorporate these trails, it's really gonna set a standard for this area. Century Farms is uh, going to become a destination spot for the, for the 24 corridor. Setting this type of standard with multifamily development will only help preserve our area and our community in the future. Thank you. Any others in support? Okay, are there any in opposition? If you please come forward. Also state your name and address. My name is Twanachik and again, it's. I'm here for comment. It's not really support or lack of support. Um, I live at 5967 Cane Ridge Road. Although I'm the president of the Cane Ridge Community Club, which does represent this development area, I'm speaking more personally this evening. This developer did approach us about nine months ago and presented a tentative plan. Based upon that, uh, the community resource declaration that residents of Cane Ridge adopted, as well as items that had been repeatedly brought up by residents and discussions of numerous plans in the area. We gave this developer feedback. This developer has met with us three times and has made numerous additional changes to address our concerns each time they continue to address our concerns. Tuesday night, we had another public meeting with them. This was the third public meeting, totally public. Issues that were raised included concerns about traffic, the impact on schools, safety, and more. An overriding concern was one that has been brought up to, with each developer, that they put their intentions into writing in a way that's enforceable. There are plans for this to occur if this moves through to the council. Our community will not support its move through council readings otherwise. There was a louder voice Tuesday night though. It is the voice of community members saying no to more development without the underlying infrastructure being able to support it. They mentioned items like school buildings, school staff, police protection, fire protection, water supplies, traffic infrastructure, and more. It was really interesting. My recollection is that they were all Metro government responsibilities that were mentioned. There were not any persons who spoke against the actual presentation done by the developer, which includes community access to many of their amenities. Instead, it was a commentary on Metro and the services provided by our government and the fear that any new development is not adequately supported by government services. In my not always humble opinion, we in Metro have not, we have done a poor job of planning for our future. We have failed to take sufficient right of ways to build our schools for future capacity, to keep our employment positions desirable enough within Metro, sorry. So I'm not speaking in opposition. I'm trying to draw attention to the fact that we in Metro need to do a better job and to ask you to please involve us however you can. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Good evening. Uh, my name is John Stern. I live at 1437 Winding Creek Drive, but I'm here representing the Cane Ridge Community Trust. Um, our job, which we, we found ourselves involved in, uh, was to take the community uh, benefits of I mean, the community resource agreement that the community created and to make it enforceable to ensure that developers that come to the community actually consider the things that the community wants to uh, have as part of these developments. And to ensure that if Metro is unable to enforce them, that we can, in a civil court, uh, manage that Metro function for you. Um, we are here in support of the process, uh, both yours and ours, uh, and you are an extremely important part of it. We have been in conversations with Wood Partners for, as they said, a good part of the year. Uh, while we're not quite yet at a point of agreement, there have been significant dialogue uh, from lots of different perspectives. And it is our sincere hope that we will come to a legally binding agreement on the design, development, and maintenance of this product that they wish to bring to the Cambridge community. We're also here to seek your help, because we need it. While the policies that the current community plan have in place 
are there, there's not that many people out in the community that support the policies that are in place. So we are hoping that in the coming months, in the coming year, that you will join with us in creating a new community plan for the Cane Ridge community uh, as part of the ongoing or the new update process for the community plans. And we need your help in designing that uh, and in designing the process by which we get to the plan. One that truly engages the community in significant and meaningful ways. Anything that you can do uh, in support of our area, we would appreciate it. We'll provide you with the uh, Cane Ridge uh, resource declaration. So you might take a look at it as well as what our new organization is set to do with the rest of Cane Ridge. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Any others in opposition? Support. Oh, support, okay. Yeah, you can come up. <laughs> Just state your name and address. Uh, Megan Peace, 118 16th Avenue South. I have family that lives in the local area and are directly impacted by this development, so I'm very thankful for the work that what Partners has put into the deal. Um, increased employment opportunities, corporate relocations, introduction of new retailers, all positives of Cane Ridge's growth, but soaring home prices, population growth, tightening lending standards, and unprecedented demand are all difficulties to many desiring home ownership. This development site will allow many to benefit from the growth that Antioch has seen by providing a community, a community that is accessible not only in connectivity, but accessible relative to the other many Class A developments that are going on in Nashville. This site supports Cane Ridge's notoriety as a top neighborhood in Nashville. The product and lifestyle that Wood Partners will develop will set a standard for the quality of real estate and construction that the neighborhood deserves. Walking trails, quality interiors, and direct access to jobs and retail are amenities that typically come at a luxurious price. This site will offer a high-end lifestyle to residents at a rate that is a significant discount to the other many options in Nashville. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any others in support or <laughs> opposition? Okay, would the applicant like to have a two-minute rebuttal? Very quick, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanna say that uh, I've, I've enjoyed uh, participating with the Cane Ridge Community Club and the Trust, independent of Wood Partners here today. I've actually uh, advised both of those organizations uh, independently and helped them with their community resource declaration, for example. Um, and I wanna read uh, the remainder of what Twana Chick was, uh, was hoping to finish. Uh, so her comment tonight is this, let's start planning in a way that considers all concurrent developments and planned developments instead of myopically considering only that one which is before us. Let us in the community know how we can support standards that leave us in a better position in 100 years. Please encourage developers to work with community members and groups. Let's work on our foundation so that we continue to be a vibrant city. And to that end, and this will make a little more sense because we're gonna be following up uh, with staff uh, regarding this particular zoning bill. Uh, we've got a community meeting again set for next month and we're looking forward to continuing that dialogue. So we appreciate your support here tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, public hearing is closed. Um, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Uh, I'm pleased to hear lots of community engagement and it sounds like a community and development team is not so far apart. The question here, or rather assurance here is community is wanting guarantee. It development sounds great, open space sounds great, Ingress, egress sounds great. Public park sounds great. How can we be assured that's exactly what a community will be getting? And if it is a specific plan as a commissioner, I would, yes, community, here's the condition, here's the, the all in detail, and you can still keep working in the uh, council to put all the condition until the last, uh, product is agreed upon. So in this case, uh, this is RM20, uh, RM9. So 
a question to the staff. What kind of tool as a commissioner will have to guarantee the, because this is a straightforward zone change. It's not specific plan, but you know, what development is proposing and what community is wanting is not far apart. So what kind of tool can we have to make that happen for both parties? So when we review um, requests that come in, um, we look at them through the lens of the existing development patterns that are surrounding the land use policy um, to come up with what is the appropriate zoning district. Um, not all sites need an SP. Uh, when we're looking at whether or not um, to um, either request that something be, become an SP, or, or we're looking at um, broader planning goals. Um, so that might be the need for public street connectivity, um, the need to be particularly um, sensitive to environmental concerns, um, those sorts of things. So we're looking to the broader goals, the broader planning goals as to whether or not an SP is needed. Um, from our staff perspective, that wasn't, um, uh, needed for this site. Um, there is some small areas of conservation, but not um, a critical level on the site. Um, additionally, looking at the broader connectivity, we didn't see the need to be looking at public road infrastructure or connectivity. Um, there are tools that the developer and the community can work on together that are then enforceable privately, um, and those may include things that we ne can't necessarily include as a metro government anyway. And so um, from our perspective, looking at it from the planning um, review, um, the policy supports RM9. Thank you. So I understand as a, a role, as a, as a commissioner, our deciding guideline is, is this uh, zone change, if this proposal is within the general plan. And if it is, we as a commissioner are bound to approve it. If we find it is not uh, within the general plan, we will be able to state uh, it is not. So I understand it is uh, within general plan. For that sense, I have no reason to oppose it. However, I would like to have a community and developer to come up with creative solution to abide by uh, what kind of a development will be coming in here. It will be like a memorandum of understanding. Uh, you two can work out. But I think as a commissioner, our hands are rather tight. Thank you. Um, so what some I have some similar concerns because what I heard tonight was a lot of we committed to do this, we committed to do that, um, and with straight rezones, that's there there's no commitment. I mean you can say there's a commitment, but when it's a straight rezone, it becomes a straight rezone and that's your you becomes your property entitlements. Um, Council Lady Lee, I have known for very many years, and I know that she will make sure that this is um, that there will be some more clarity for the council when it comes there and, and some agreement. Agreements. So it's good to hear that you already have another meeting planned. Um, I look forward to continuing this conversations and hearing more of those reassurances uh, from her and, and during the committee discussion. Um, because it does, when big projects like this are RM, it, it does concern me of how is it exactly going to be laid out, um, especially when what I'm hearing overwhelmingly from the ladies of Southeast um, is they don't want more apartments. I hear it every public hearing. Um, I actually hear it every council meeting, I think, from them. <laughs> um, and so that that's what I'm going to need to hear by the time we get to council, is, is that the ladies of the Southeast are in support of this, um, that the community is feels more comfortable with the commitments that you're making on, on trees and walking trails, because all of that sounds wonderful. But again, I need to I need to feel more comfortable by the time it gets to council. Um, so yeah, I, I think from what we're hearing, it does sound really great. Um, and I think the zone change, change is appropriate with the community plan. Um, 
I always like, in cases like this, to hear from the council person here, but I, I trust that moving along the process, there's been a lot of community engagement that she will do what needs to be done on the council level. So um, I am in support. I agree with what's been said. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, everybody involved here. We are so desperate in our city for some kind of model of how everybody comes together to do this kind of thing. I also want you, uh, Mr. Stern and Ms. Chick, to know that I hear your exhortation to us as a city. Uh, we need more infrastructure, and we certainly need tools. And we can't SP everything to death because there's not enough people if we make sure the SPs are actually happening. But somewhere we don't have a tool that when this kind of thing happens, we can ensure that it gets put in as conditions or something. This is with a straight zoning change, we're gonna to have to trust that the council will do that. And that's always, having lived in neighborhoods where promises were often broken, that's very frightening for me. Um, and I really wanna just uh, make sure that in this kind of case, um, that somewhere we capture this. Y'all could be a great case study on how to do this right. And I don't know how we begin to document what works and what doesn't work, and it's like one more thing neighborhoods need to do. But you're on to something very exciting here, and I just pray and hope that the council will reinforce, in our absence of tools, what you guys are trying to do there. Okay, can I get a motion? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. All right, there is no historic zoning commission report. Um, <laughs> the Board of Parts, he is not here today, so there is no parts and recreation report. I don't think there is anyone left from the executive committee, so there is no executive committee report. <laughs> Councilman, is there a legislative report? I, I feel like there shouldn't be. I, well, I don't, I'm not aware of one. <laughs> Okay, if there's okay. any other business, no. Okay, real quick, um, we all met Alex today. Um, Hello, he Alex. is uh, replacing Susan Jones on the land use team. Susan served our city for many years, but we're very excited to meet um, Alex, who graduated from Vandy Law. He's worked at Metro Legal since 2011. He did, uh, he's joined the fun side um, from doing health services and social services. At land use is fun, right? Um, and is captain of the Recreational League hockey team, the Jackalope Dark Knights. So don't challenge him on the ice. So with that, I conclude my report. Thank okay. you. Okay, I have a motion to adjourn? Yes. Okay, we are, we are adjourned. <laughs>